Welcome back everyone to day three of our virtual micro lux, the final day of the event. And we have to say thank you to everyone who's been tuning in. We've had people tuning in from all over the world and you have been really great at your engagement and you flooded us, flooded us with questions and comments and we really appreciate that. My name is Rich Park, the founder of Microlux and of What's on the Wrist YouTube. I have been and one of your and am one of your guests this entire weekend, along with Ariel Adams. Oops, but he will join us a little later on. He is the founder of a blog to watch, and it's been one of the original uh, watch bloggers since 2007. He's also written countless. Uh, articles in many publications. He is a real well renowned watch expert. Uh, he's also my good friend and Ariel will join us a little later on along with our other host Victoria Gamelski. She is the editor-in-chief of JCK magazine which is the oldest and largest trade publications for uh, the jewelry and watch industry and Victoria is really talented and you know I wouldn't be surprised if her work is her work has been seen in everywhere. I wouldn't even be surprised if it hasn't been in Sports Illustrated. She is just a really cool and really well-rounded person, and uh, it's been real joy working with her. So Virtual Microlux is the very first virtual watch event in the U.S., and again, we couldn't be more proud of that. It's been a really incredible journey, uh, and I have to thank our sponsors, eBay, Bindi Jewelers, and Breitling. They've been a great support uh, to the show. And I want to take this moment to thank our crew because uh, they have worked tire tirelessly behind the camera to really help my vision come to life. Um, without them, I wouldn't be able to do uh, what I'm doing for this entire weekend. And I have to thank the people behind the cameras who you don't get the chance to see, but they deserve all the credit. Ed Ree, Drew Coab, Jeffrey Meinkees, Scott Badinger, Neil White, Neil Willinson, and Sean White. Thank you to everyone for really helping make this show possible. So we are going to be joined with our first guest, Don Cochran from Vertex. Hey, Don, how are you? Very well. How are you? Um, well, you're, calling, you're joining us from London. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's uh, about five past seven in the evening here. Let's show the watch that you just checked your time with. Check the time. <laughs> As the Vertex Bronze 75. We're twins. I know you've got over there. Yeah, yeah. And we were just talking before the show. You are, it's winter there. That would explain yeah. the, the cozy turtleneck. Yeah, absolutely. It's probably <laughs> about 10 degrees outside. And I actually, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So I also, I thought you were in a museum, but that's actually your office. You have some really cool prints back there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, yeah, it's, it's nice to be inspired by the things around you. Isn't it? Yep. And the last time we saw each other was that virtual Microlux in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, not virtual, just Microlux Chicago last yeah. year. Yeah. Seems like a long time ago now. The world's gone through a lot since then. It has. So it's really good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you too. So I want to talk about how you resurrected the brand from your great grandfather, Claude Lyons. You want to yeah. explain how you resurrected the Vertex brand? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, it was sort of so my great great grandfather, um, Claude Lyons, uh, set up Vertex in 1916. Um, and it ran all the way up until 1972, when it closed down um, due to the court crisis and, and the family not wanting to continue the business. Then about six and a half years ago, um, my grandmother died and uh, she was 99 and a half, an amazing woman and a, a real sort of inspiration um, for me. Uh, and I was sitting at work feeling very sad about that and um, I suddenly like an epiphany really, but wouldn't it be great if I could bring her father's watch company back? Um, luckily she left me a little bit of money. So I used that money to, um, buy back the trademarks and the IP. Mm. Uh, and then, um, during that whole process, I, I discovered many stories, wonderful vertex stories, really. Um, but the one that we're most well known for now is being one of the suppliers for the British during the second world war. Um, those 12 suppliers are now called the dirty dozen right. fraternity. Um, and Vertex was lucky enough to be uh, one of the Dirty Dozen. So the watch we made for them um, uh, went on to serve, you know, for another yeah. 30 years um, and became the basis of our reimagination. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. I know the story that you had is, is, is a really great story. I love that story. I love everything about Vertex. And sometimes stories are used as marketing ploys. But I've known you, I've known you personally now for a few years, so I actually know... The, the reasons you started up 
those are actually true and genuine stories and uh, no, absolutely. really touching. Yeah. I, mean, I never really meant to do, it was never designed to be commercial. It was never designed yeah. for anything other than just to, to um, be a, a lasting memory for my grandmother and her, her father and her husband, my grandfather, who ran the company up until 1972. Um, you know, it's just a, it seemed like a nice thing to be able to do. Um, and it's yeah. been incredibly fulfilling as a project. And then who knew, fast forward to 2020, that Vertex would just blow up the way it did with something that you started with a passion, a genuine passion from your heart, and now yeah. Vertex is just so beloved. There isn't a single person that I know that has anything bad to say about Vertex or, or you. No, thank you. Well, I mean, I, you know, hopefully we don't do anything wrong to upset anyone. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's, it's, we, it, we, I feel incredibly lucky how well Vertex has been received by uh, not just the people that have bought Vertexes, but also the watch press and, and the sort of uh, right. historical watch journalists. Um, you know, it's, it very quickly reestablished itself so it could be in a room with um, much more well-renowned um, brands, which is, makes me very happy. Yes. So you started with the M100, and then in 2017, you had this marvelous relaunch at the home of the Duke of Wellington in London. Yeah. That's quite a feat. Tell us how, how, how that happened, how you were welcome in that home. Well, I mean, to be honest, I'm a, I'm a big believer in universal causality and that, that some things just happen because they're meant to happen. And um, I knew um, the Duke um, oh. through, through a friend of, of mine. Um, and I was planning the launch and I was trying to think what to do. And as I was walking down one of the streets in Mayfair, he came out of one of the private members clubs and I was like, hey Arthur, how are you doing? I, I actually really wanted to talk to you about this because I'm planning this launch and you get invited to lots of cool things. What would be a cool thing for us to do for Vertex? And he said, um, why do you have it at my house? Because that would be a really cool thing to do. <laughs> um, before that, the only other party they'd had it there was the 50th anniversary for Vanity Fair. So it was quite, it was quite a cool thing to be able to do. And I, it's a very famous building. It's called Apsley House and it's right in the corner of Hyde Park in London. Uh, it's a massive, massive building. So it was a it was a great opportunity to tell that story. And obviously, the Duke of Wellington has incredible military history too. So we got to tell the two stories next to each other. Yeah, I saw the images of of that event. You had a lot of people there, a lot of uh, it looks like important people. Uh, so that must have been really impressive. So you are well connected, we could say. So I kind of feel more powerful now because I'm a friend of you, who was a friend of everybody else. So yeah. Um, I, <laughs> you're also a vertex owner, and once you're a vertex owner, obviously you become ex exceptionally powerful and yeah. good looking and uh, cute. Yep, and the M100. You had a, a very unique way of approaching the, the release of that. It wasn't something that anybody could just order or buy. You actually had a referral program. Yeah. But that part of it wasn't met right away with love, right? People like, oh, I don't want to have to know somebody to own this watch. But then yeah. what you sold yeah. out of that first initial yeah. run really quickly. So did that surprise you? How nervous were you when you approached the release with a I, referral I think, program? I going back to the beginning, because I hadn't designed Vertex to be commercial, I wasn't particularly worried about selling. It, wasn't, it was never designed to how quickly can we sell out. I know most watch companies, it's all about, you know, selling out instantly the second you announce something and, and that's, that's sexy. For me, it's, it's much more important that there is a value in, in the attainment of something and the value doesn't necessarily have to be defined by the financial price of a thing, that the value is the journey you go through to get something, you know, maybe you travel to another city to see something before you buy it because that's part of the the ritual, and for us, it was, it was to try and make it um, slightly more interesting, the, the attainment side of things. Um, so there is a referral side of it, or it's available to serving military or military veterans, and, and that in itself has become, you know, it, it gives them ownership of something that they should have ownership of, because it was always a military thing, and, and so that's been really wonderful as well. Yeah, I know you, I know you, I know you're really humble and, and really modest in your success, but when I say you sold out, we're not talking about five or ten pieces. We're talking 600 of, yeah. of the M100. That is no small feat. So yeah. that was a major accomplishment. So congratulations on that. And then you followed that up with the MP45 chronograph with the mono pusher. Yes. So that one, tell us about what, how you transitioned from the M100 to wanting to do the MP45. 
Um, well, I wanted to, um, I think a money pusher and uh, has always been my favorite watch, sort of watch. And, um, well, let me it interrupt you for a moment. I'm sorry. So I know you know and I know what a mono pusher is, but for some people that aren't familiar with what a mono pusher is, which I love, uh, explain what a mono pusher is. Well, it's, it's a single button chronograph. So on most chronographs now, you have two buttons, one that's start and stop and another one that's reset. Um, a mono pusher, all those functions are on one button. So start, stop, reset is all on one button. Um, the idea of this watch originally, it was designed at the end of the war as an uh, ordnance disposal watch. Um, so there's lots of unexploded munitions everywhere, and the technician would get to the bomb with a five-minute, six-minute fuse, start his little uh, money pusher, and start working on it. And I love that honesty of it, and I love the purity of it. And we often talk about purity of purpose of military um, equipment because it's designed specifically to do something as simply as possible, but as as reliably as possible. And I think that gives it huge relevance now because it, it's it's fit for purpose. And, it's not. It wasn't designed to be cool or fashionable or you know clever. It's, it was designed to do the job, um, and quite a serious job at the time. So it was wonderful that we were involved in the development of that watch with Lamania at the time in, in 1945. The war finished um, obviously in 1945, and because Vertex was in Britain, it was rationed to how many movements they were allowed to bring into the country, and um, so we stopped making the two watches. We we didn't make the money pusher in the end. Yeah. So it was my chance to to make it, um, and it's been great. I made it for me, and I love it. So it's, yeah, it's, no, so do I. Uh, I think we're looking at a nice commercial that uh, you produced. Did you did you produce and direct it? But this is just really well done. It looks like a a short story, like a real film. How did that 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 video come about? Um, uh, well, I mean, again, it's it's about um, telling our story. Really, I mean, the lovely thing Vertex gets to do. Um, is it, it, it was there. We did put watches on the wrists of soldiers who fought their ways up the beaches in Normandy and then went on to liberate Europe and Asia. Um, and that's a really lovely thing to be able to do. So it's, it's really taking ownership of that um, and making people feel more connected to those stories. Yeah, no, I'm watching this commercial right now. It's being seen. It, it, it makes me feel like this. It should, I'm watching a Tom Hanks movie or something that Spielberg <laughs> would direct. It just has that, that film noir, that, that spy yeah. feel. We're really well, we're well very done. Lucky. Again, again, very lucky. You know, we, we, that was shot in the Churchill War Rooms, which is quite a oh. historically important part of Whitehall, where Churchill in the 40s um, moved the cabinet to right. when London was being blitzed um, really badly. Um, and we approached them and said, would this be possible? Um, and because Vertex was there at the time, they said it would be. So that was really lovely. Um, so again, it's something that you couldn't do necessarily if you, you saw that you're in watch brand now, but because Vertex has that historical significance again, it gives us certain access. And, and so we got to do that. And it was fun. I got to sit at Churchill's desk and uh, <laughs> show you how to put your strap on your watch, which was fun. Yeah, you, you've done, I think you would make uh, Claude Lyons, your great grandfather, really proud with the direction and what you've done uh, with the Vertex brand. Um, you. I'm sure you, you've got to think about that sometimes, right? Maybe, maybe before you lay your head to the pillow at night, just kind of honoring him and saying, wow, this, this has really been more than, more than I thought it would be. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of lovely moments. I mean, I think last year at some point I was taking some watches to show a journalist in East London. I was walking down one of the old streets in, in the city um, with a kind of briefcase full of watches. And I, I imagine it's exactly what my grandfather did and my great-grandfather did. <laughs> and, and I had this kind of little momentary kind of, yeah, that's really cool. That, that they, we both walked down the street with this briefcase of watches. With the same, <laughs> it's kind of cool. Yeah. So now fast forward to now, and we you've come up with the MP, oh no, I'm sorry, it's the Bronze 75, which is a similar version to the M100, except it's in bronze. Yeah, so it's it, realistically, in many ways, it's identical to the M100, one here. Mm -hmm. um, the difference being that it's a bronze case, bronze hand, slightly um, patinated lumina, so the, the, the color of the loom is slightly different. And the, the back of the watch itself is an exact um, replica of the watch from the Second World War. Um, which is kind of cool too. So yep. this year, if you didn't know it already, it's the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. 
Mm-hmm. Um, VE Day was in uh, May the 8th, and VJ Day was August the 12th. And I think the actual technical end of the Second World War was September the 2nd. Um, so uh, there was a lot of celebration this year. Well, it, actually, it was very muted because of COVID. Um, but it was still significant enough for us to want to tell the story again. Um, and I think bronze is a really nice medium for doing that. Um, I'm overjoyed by the way it's turned out and the reception it's had has been fantastic. Um, and, and it's lovely to work with a medium that has its own, will have its own story, you know, rather than just the hands turning the time, the case itself shows its age and, and reacts to the world around it. Although the alloy we've used, um, won't degrade as much as some because it's, it's, it's uh, quite a high mix, but it's, it will age. So this has the same hands, which is, they're made of loom sticks. Is that, how, how would you explain the outrageous loom on these watches? Yeah, well, it's, it's molded super loom and over. So if you look at a M100, every number is made out of a loom block and that loom block is 0.5 of a mil high. Um, so they um, react very strongly to light. Um, and uh, we're, we've become kind, of, kind of famous for that luminosity, <laughs> which, is, which is fun. Um, and I think there's something quite, you know, it's, it's the child in us, things that glow in the dark are kind of cool. And this really glows in the dark, so that's fun. Yeah, we just had a question uh, from one of the viewers, and he's asking, what do the arrows mean uh, on the okay. watches? So, um, that's called the broad arrow or the phenom. And originally it was to denote crown property. So it became relevant in about 1674. Um, you'll see it on, in, in England anyway, or Britain, you'll see it on uh, mile markers on the road that show the distance between things. You'll see it on prison uniforms back in the day. Mm. And then more importantly, you'll find it on all military equipment up until 19, uh, 1967 uh, when they stopped using it. Um, Importantly, during the Second World War, um, I just reached behind me and pick up one of the original Dirty Dozen watches. Um, the um, it was on all the original Dirty Dozen watches. So uh, I had that. You lent that to me in my possession. I remember um, that. So that. That's it there. So it, um, you can't legally use it now um, without permission from the government. So before we made the watch, we approached the government and then, uh, and got permission to use it, which is lovely because I think it means a lot. It, it's it's there's a great deal of relevance to to having it on the watch. Um, so we're very lucky. Um, we're allowed to have it on the M100 and the MP45 because they are um, uh, they denote the same historical. They're, they're based on a historical watch. Um, yeah. But we probably won't be using it too much if we as we move forward, unless we're making watch specifically for the military. Sure. No, there is so much authenticity in this watch. Uh, this is also limited edition to 150? 150, yeah. And the movement on here, this is a manual wind movement. Yeah, manual wind ETA 7001 movement. Um, I l really, really love manual wind. Yeah. Um, the um, dirty dozen watch, this, uh, what we call the Cal 59, is uh, a manual wind too. And there's something just very healthy about winding a oh, watch. I agree. I, yeah. 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 And, it, and, and, you know, I th it's really interesting when I, um, originally started the M100 program with our manufacturing partner in Switzerland. Um, we were the only manual watch they were making that year. And since then, um, something like 40% of their watches they're making now are manual. So yeah. it's amazing how much manual has increased just in the last four or five years. Yeah, I still don't think uh, there are enough made. Just, uh, for anyone who doesn't have a manual wine watch, I highly recommend adding that to your collection because it's just a, an entirely different feeling. Yeah. What, what is the retail price on the bronze? Uh, so in uh, so we don't have a dollar price because we we ship from the UK, but the price Pounds. without uh, tax I think is two thousand uh, two hundred and fifty pounds. Yeah, I I can attest. You know, I have the 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 M one hundred, the first one, and the MP forty five. I wear those almost daily. Those are just gorgeous okay. watches. I, I the history behind it, um, you being my friend, all of those things uh, contribute to making that watch have this great value to me. And I think that is one of the reasons that uh, Vertex is so beloved. It has that genuine and authentic history behind it by someone that was part of the family. Yeah, no, we're really lucky. And the fact that we sell our watches directly means that we know every single person who owns a Vertex. 
um, and they're part of the story now. So that's really important too. And it's a really diverse community from fairly, you know, people who have done incredible things to people who just have, you know, a real love yeah. for that period in time. And, and, you know, that's great. So I just want to put that into some perspective about Vertex being among the Dirty Dozen watches. I mean, you were, Vertex was in there along with brands like Omega and, and SEMA and, and Longine um, among yeah. that Dirty Dozen. So that is... You know, IWC, Jaeger, Lecoutre, um, you know, there's some fairly big right. brands. An incredible, an incredible, incredible list of brands that Vertex yeah. was a part of. Um, yeah. I know that you showed me a future Vertex model uh, earlier, but uh, are you ready to, talk, to announce that yet, or is that still uh, under the wraps? It's, it's, uh, we're developing a dive watch at the moment, yeah. um, and I haven't made any secrets about that, so that's fine. <laughs> um, I don't have it to show you, unfortunately, because um, we're, we're just going through our third stage of prototypes, because you really need to get this stuff right. Yeah. And each time you change something, it takes about six months, so... Um, that's uh, that'll be fun. Um, I saw it. I saw your journaling. It was it. It's another. Yeah. You're going to have another hit on your hand. Ver Vertex can do no wrong. <laughs> well, let's see. And before that, um, you can be the first to see the, uh, the steel straps that we we've developed for the M100 and and the. I MP did not. I did not. I did not see that. You were you were keeping that. Yeah, well, these only arrived on Friday, um, so these will be uh, available uh, hopefully by the end of the year. Obviously extendable. Um, Nice. And it, it, it does somewhat change the feel of the watch. That's a yeah. M100, a MP45, and you can see it, it changed the watch considerably. I agree, and yeah. It's a, a very high quality 361 steel um, uh, strap. When are um, those with, available? When are the steel bracelets? Uh, hopefully by the end of the year, so just before Christmas, and, and I hope. Just in time for the holidays. Yeah. Great and time. It have, um, like all our watches, it will have quick release plugs, so you don't need any special equipment to change it. Right. This is a presentation that Vertex comes in. It's a very cool, uh, it's like a floating case. It's very, it has this, you know, like a spy, yep. kind of a spy feel to it. And it comes mm -hmm. with uh, two straps, right? Here's another, yeah. kind of a British NATO strap. Zulu Alpha strap. Yep, and, um, and another one. Yeah, and then underneath it is an AF strap, which is a re replica of the strap it would have come with in the Second World War. Taking so. this apart, and underneath mm -hmm. there, as yep. all good spies have, is a, Hollowed yeah. out section right yeah. there. The, you, there are so much details with Vertex. Even this, like, so my other Vertex cases are like a steel plating. This is also, is this a bronze or bronze yeah, color? Yeah, it's made of bronze. Um, so oh, that's kind of fun too. Yeah, vert, lots of details with Vertex. And this is, uh, I forgot what we want to call this, a Peli case. This is a real yeah, case that. Peli case. And, and you know, it, it suits the brand. It's incredibly robust. I can send watches anywhere in the world, and I know they'll come in, they'll arrive in good condition. Um, apparently, you can drive over that box with a tank, and we haven't had the chance to do that yet, but we will at some point. Okay, we just had another question come in, and I'm not sure if we covered this or not, but the question is, what is the Vertex name's origin? Okay, well, I'm afraid I don't know. So, uh -oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know what it means. So, Vertex is the coming together of two vertices, so it's generally the pinnacle of a triangle is the vertex of the triangle. Um, so it makes sense um, for that reason. But I've never been able to ask my great-grandfather, sadly. Mm. And unfortunately, I didn't ask my grandfather because I never thought to ask him. Um, so I don't know how it came about. But bizarrely, um, Rolex and Vertex started two years apart which, uh, on the same street, two doors away from each other. I so don't think I knew that. They're, they're, they're fairly close. Um, as I'm sure you know, Rolex was a British company before yeah, it came Yeah, that I did. So, yeah. Yeah. So, there are, London has been producing some, some fantastic brands other than you, yet of all the brands, and, and, and there are others that I really like so much, it seems like Vertex has just leapfrogged over so many of those brands. Uh, that would have to be because of the, not just the marketing behind it or the, the genuine history behind it. Uh, it's, like you said, getting to know you personally and then, of course, the quality of the watches. If the quality of the watches weren't good and you have this rich history and, and Don could be the nicest guy in the world, but if the quality of the watches aren't there, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. So when you build your watches, whether it's the Bronze 75 or the M100 or the MP45 or the divers that's coming up, how long of a process is that from the, from the idea that you have in your head to where you actually see your prototype? 
I mean, realistically, it's probably about two years uh, oh. to, to delivery. So prototypes probably a year. Um, depends how much time you spend in prototype playing and, with things. And do, is that, are you just locked in on that? Do you just infatuate about that 24-7 where you're thinking, okay, I have yeah. this idea in my head, it goes to pen to paper, then it goes to computer, and then it goes to manufacturing? Yeah. It, I mean, I, I try not to think about it too much because it's scary. And then occasionally <laughs> I'll get a delivery um, which comes in a box like this, which will be a, a prototype watch. <laughs> And, I, and sometimes I don't open the box for two days because I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it's quite a big deal when, when they arrive. Um, and, uh, and, you know, generally, I mean, when the bronze arrived, I was so thrilled because I never, we never prototyped the bronze. We went straight from, I want to do a bronze M100. We did some drawings and some color things and chose the alloy. Um, but apart from that, I had never seen it. I'd never seen a prototype and I was mm. ready. Again, I, I pay for them up front, so I pay for 150 watches because that's the way they work with me, and, and they're not cheap. Um, yeah. They're a lot more expensive than you'd imagine. Um, and so there is a, a bit of fear <laughs> that I may have got it wrong and it may not work, but with the bronze, it's been amazing, and everyone that's got one is, is very happy with them. Yeah, this w I had high expectations when I unboxed it based on the M100 and the MP45, and then I said, yeah, yeah. This just did not disappoint. Uh, there was so much. Uh, it's just a real joy. Uh, it's super comfortable um, to wear, and the leather strap uh, as well. How do you? And is this leather strap is lined. I think it might be yeah, lined with lined, rubber, but it's designed to patinate like the watch, so it will. It should age really nicely too. I mean, this one I'm wearing. Um, I've been wearing it for three months now, and it's still still pretty much okay. But I, uh, I like them when you can see the age in them, and you can feel, you know, so it's kind of fun. How much obsession do you put into choosing the leather for for your straps? Is that uh, as where is that on the hierarchy? <laughs> I don't want to sound weird. Um, no, I mean I, it's it's fun, and it's just I just have fun with it. You just you just get different samples and and look at the samples and feel the samples and and try and imagine how it will complement the dial color or the hands and that sort of thing. You have uh, a really rich life. Uh, <laughs> so, a very, cherished, a very it, cherished life. There is so much more to Don than just, uh, just a Vertex brand. You're quite the, you like motorcycles too, right? Bikes? Yeah, motorcycles. I was at Goodwood today with, uh, we were sponsoring a couple of racing cars at Goodwood Speed Week. So Goodwood, if you don't know, is this amazing country estate in West Sussex in England. Yeah. Um, owned by the Duke of Richmond, and and they've had a horrible year because they haven't been able to do any events. But they just put one on this weekend, which was a closed event, so no public. But mm -hmm. it's amazing racing cars. Yeah, I follow uh, you on Instagram, and you live quite. The, you are quite the rock star uh, in <laughs> London. So thank you for for joining us. This is Don Cochran from Vertex, and where can they learn more about Vertex watches? Uh, so www.vertex-watches.com. Um, and any questions, info at vertexwatches.com, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Yes, he will. Don, thank you so much. Great. Thank you for having me. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye, my friend. So up next, we have Ite Noi from Ite Noi at 1140. We'll see you in just a few minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. We are with Itay Noy from Itay Noy. All the way, he's joining us from Tel Aviv. Welcome, Itay. Shalom. Thank you for, for making me be here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm starting to feel trilingual around you. Um, so I, I'm looking at the first thing that's standing out is that studio. If anyone's thinking, because we, we, we just got done talking, it looks like a, a very luxurious mansion. But that's your office. This is your new studio. Yeah, this is my office. I like to come here every day to make my watches. Yeah. And uh, yeah. That is. It's a studio, but it's also a gallery. So it's uh, located in the old city of Jaffa. Uh, so there are a lot of tourists, not right now because of the COVID. <laughs> right. But uh, usually there are a lot of tourists here. So, uh, this threw me a little bit off guard, but what, what do you mean by gallery? Is that, is that, do you have an Ite Noi store within your office? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a studio when people can enter and see me working here and right. making watches. And of course, there is a display so uh, everyone can uh, buy a watch if he likes and, and see me in my work. Yeah, that is, that's, that's one of the nicest studios I've seen. But it shouldn't be a, a surprise because you're actually celebrating 20 years uh, of watchmaking. That is uh, an enormous accomplishment. It's anyway, it's very well established. I've known uh, of you for quite some time. You are a creator of just works of art watches. I'm, I'm wearing the, the rally right now, and we'll, we'll cover this in a little bit. Um, but 20 years, part of that accomplishment or celebration was coming up with the night flight. What was that process and how did the night flight come about? And I, and I think we have video of that. Yeah, uh, actually I was invited to Taiwan uh, by the craft center there, uh, with, uh, along with uh, 10 different designers worldwide. And we were asked to uh, get to know the local craft in Taiwan and to make something and uh, collaborate with the local craftsmen in our work. So I was immediately fell in love with the lacquer work and, and I saw the black with the shining pieces and I just wanted to make something in my pieces. Uh, but I didn't want to make something uh, decorative uh, just to make something nice. I wanted to have something more uh, conceptual so I was thinking about how to develop the idea. And I remember that every time that I fly at night, I really liked uh, the view from the window when I look at the cities, uh, all the yeah. lights. So that was my inspiration. And I, that's what I did. So I chose a few uh, important or very nice uh, city uh, from all over the world. And I made uh, this uh, collection, that, which is one of a kind uh, piece uh, so, of each city. So is that an aerial view then from a point of view from, uh, from the top yeah. looking? That is... That I mean, is I used nice. the pictures, uh, you know, uh, from NASA uh, or other uh, sure. pictures from, yeah, uh, from uh, the sky. And I, uh, uh, everything is authentic. Uh, so I made a photo and I just, uh, um, it's a handmade process with uh, uh, about five to ten uh, layers of lacquer. In between, uh, there is uh, pieces of uh, gold. And uh, of course, uh, you can see the different kind of lights and colors inside because it's transparent. And those, the glimmering, what looks like lights, are all created from stones or those are like gems? Actually, actually it's pure gold. But what? the layer, the, the transparent layer uh, with a different kind of color gives it uh, 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 the shining of uh, uh, different colors. That is amazing looking. What is the size? Uh, is that 40, 42 millimeters? Actually, it's 44. Okay. Uh, 44 millimeters. I, can, I have one here. <laughs> that is that is absolutely a work of art, and I, I okay yeah. So I know we talked off air, and that actually happens to be one of your most expensive uh, models. What is the retail on that? 
is 16,800. So, uh, yeah. uh, it's, I know it's uh, quite expensive, but it's one of a kind piece. It takes a few months to make each piece. And actually, for me, it's more an art piece beside uh, all the other pieces. Uh, so, um, because I'm celebrating this uh, 20th anniversary this year, I have decided to, to make something that will be uh, something that I really like and without caring about the price. So, it's okay. Yeah, so one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, 16800 is certainly not an inexpensive watch. What would you tell uh, anyone who says, my chirp and thing, $16,000, I, I, I could buy a Rolex, I could buy this, that, the other. What would you tell uh, somebody who would just make that comment without actually seeing that watch? First of all, it's one of a kind. Yeah. So you have something that no one will have, only you. And of course, I explained all the effort that I put in order to make this uh, project. It took me uh, 18 months to accomplish uh, the project. And the first uh, uh, pieces are only 10 different cities. Uh, so uh, this is, I mean, this is my explanation. Yeah, it, no, it makes sense. It's definitely uh, for someone who is a real watch connoisseur that isn't looking for uh, the same type of watch that someone across the room has. If you have that, you're going to have something that, is that also limited to 150, did you say, or, or 10? No, it's one piece. You, yeah, it's only one piece. piece. Yeah, from each city there is one piece. Oh, each city. I, yeah, each city one piece. Okay. Uh, for example, I, I have uh, from uh, Jerusalem and I have uh, Las Vegas and uh, Athens and Berlin, uh, etc. Uh, but from each city I might do uh, five different views of the city, but that's it. It's limited to one piece and each city could be five different views. And so that night, um, the process you said takes 18 months. So that's from the time that you have this idea in your head that's inspired by your travels to yeah. putting pen to paper, to putting it on your computer, and then finally... Uh, how, but I can't imagine this, you would have prototypes for something like this. Do you, how do you get that first piece? Is it just an actual production model, or does this also have a prototype? I, I've been there uh, for two weeks, twice, and I, I've been working with a uh, local craftsman in order to get the best result. I can tell you, in order to make one good piece, you need to start with 10, and then you get the final uh, perfect piece. And, okay. Yeah. And so the other nine that, so that quote doesn't make the cut, what happens to that? Are you still able to use some of that materials, like the gold, for the, they no. get thrown away? Yes. I'm going to give you my address, Ete, and you can, <laughs> you can send me the ones that okay. don't make the cut. All right. No, that, yeah. that is, that is a, a, a really wor uh, a work of art. Um, I know you talked about Berlin as one of the cities that you have that, and I know that you also shared that you are a father and your son had just left for college recently in Berlin. Yeah. So I ask you... I hope you gave him an Etenoi watch so to make sure that he's on time for his classes. And you, and you responded that he already has a lot of Etenoi watches. Do you yes. see him following in your footstep, or do you want him to forge his own future in whatever endeavor he wants? Actually, he's, he's planning to study industrial design, and he's uh, working with me from time to time. Uh, he's a professional photographer, so the video that you have uh, with the night flight, he made it. He video. did that, okay. He, he did that for me. His name is Uri, Uri Noy, and now he's in uh, Berlin, and, and I hope that one day he will uh, join me or help me uh, doing my watches. So he did that video uh, even before graduating. This is his skill set already pre-college, pre-classes. Yeah, he studied in art uh, school since, since he was uh, six. So you know a lot of, uh, about art, design, and photography. He's well ahead of the curve. Uh, if this is his work now, I can't wait to see his work in four years. So, so Berlin, was that part of the reason? Because he's going to school in Berlin. Was that one of the reasons you chose that city? 
to watch? I mean, we, we have we have a German nationality, so it will be okay. easier for him to study there and to live there for a few years. Yeah. And every Itainoi model is uh, made of 150 pieces, correct? No. <laughs> Incorrect. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I make only 150 pieces a year in total. Uh, I make all the pieces myself. I don't have any manufacturer. This this is the place behind me that I am uh, making the watches, assemble them. Upstairs, I have all the other uh, departments. Uh, I also make the gold plating and the painting and the brushing and, and the straps. You wear and all so the hats. Everything is made here. Uh, and of course, I make I buy uh, Swiss movement top quality movement, and I make all the complications here in the studio. So if you see the chrono gears, uh, the time tone, and uh, um, part time reorder, they're all made, made by me. Uh, I mean, it's a model that I make for the, for the watchers in order to make something different. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so I know that we, we talked about the night flight at uh, on the higher end of Itainoi, but Itainoi watches aren't all in the $18,000 range. They actually start in the twos, $2,000 range? $2,400, yeah. Okay, and I have the rally here on my wrist here. If I take it off, I, I don't want to take it off, but I'm going to take it off. So what is the the, the price uh, on this rally? This is uh, $5,150, and you know that I don't have the watch here because I gave it to you. You're not getting it back. <laughs> 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 I make, as I, as I said before, I make the watches to order, so I don't have here any inventory for the rally. Mm -hmm. When I order, oh, I make that it, movement. choose the serial number. We're looking the at rally. the movement right now, yeah. Ute. Tell us about that movement that we're seeing on screen. Oh, we just, had, the, we just had an image of your movement. That is a, this is a beautiful movement. Okay, so, it, so it's a black uh, skeleton, uh, black returning skeleton. Um, uh, unitas, um, there and I is. make the, the dial, uh, and I try to expose the important part of of uh, uh, the dial uh, of the movement. Sorry, and this uh, and the rally was made. Uh, actually, it's a recent uh, collection, but uh, two years ago there was a rally race in uh, Israel. It's mm -hmm. called Holy Land 1000, and I was invited by the uh, organizer to make a special limited edition watch for the people that come with their rally cars. Um, so I made only 40 pieces, and I sold them uh, almost immediately. Right. I saw that. The Especially Holy Land, yeah. Event. And I have a lot of uh, requests uh, doing a new collection uh, based on this Holy Land. So this is the result, and I was uh, happy to uh, to show it. I mean, this year in the 20 years of the anniversary, uh, that I uh, make something back to my customer that asked me to to repeat and yeah. to change something. Yeah. So I'm looking at, at the rally in my hand, and I had some questions about the dial. So it looks like at nine o'clock, it might be. It looks like at the grill of a car, mm -hmm. and then. Yeah. And then the, the two tubes at 3 o'clock, it says F and E. It looks like it's a, a gas gauge. Is that, it looks, it's oh, a power reserve. I'm sorry, what? Full and empty. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's yeah. power reserve. You can see that the, uh, the lines go down when it's empty. So is this, a, this is the power reserve. This is a power reserve? Yes. Yeah, that is a very clever way to do it. And then what is the, the card out section at 4 o'clock? It's like uh, imitating the engine that you uh, wind the watch and you see it's, it's turning and uh, winding. Okay, yeah, this, a very well thought out dial. And then the, and then the carbon out section at 7 o'clock, It's like the that? steering wheel. That's the steering wheel. So we've got the steering wheel, the grill, the power reserve with the full and empty, and then the engine. This is just a very well thought out dial. The difference between this and the Holy Land, the Holy Land had something across right on 12 o'clock, right? What, what were those two functions? Uh, okay, it was the mileage of the tour that they, they did in uh, 
2018. And in the back, you could see uh, the, the path of the tour. Okay. And let's Not talk... There in, the, in the Holy Land. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And let's talk about this movement here on the rally. What, what is this movement, this, this mouth-watering movement that we're looking at? Yeah, as I said, it's, it's a unitas, uh, skeletonized uh, black ruthenium uh, that made, was made for this watch. Uh, and uh, the dial is exposing the important part of the movement. Okay. And you have another model. Is it called the fractal? Yes. T tell us about the fractal. Okay, a fractal is another uh, collection that was repeated. Uh, because of the 20 years, uh, I made it in 2006, and it's a very, it's like a mathematic uh, system that uh, uh, breaks the shape uh, and uh, multiply it uh, to another shape. So um, I started with a very simple shape, uh, like Stars of David, and I multiplied with the computer and start to break the shape until it looks like very complicated and decorative shape. So for example, I can show you, this is one of the fractals. Can you see it? Yep, very beautiful, it's a work of art. That And this is the back side, it's a micro uh, movement. Yeah, that's a non-skeletonized movement there. Yeah. Is that, what, what, what is that fractal, how much does that fractal go for? Nine thousand eight hundred, and then so the this is another shape. And these are also a one of a kind uh, pieces. So each one is limited to one. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Um, yeah. So the models that start at two thousand dollars. What kind of two thousand dollar watch? It what kind of two thousand dollar ite noi can we get if the five thousand or eighteen thousand dollars is out of our range? It's based on the 2824 ETA movement. Reliable. Uh, yeah, with a very um, small uh, case. And uh, the dial is mostly something very um, uh, uh, modern and uh, simple. So you can see the maximalism uh, uh, collection is the one that I'm talking about. Uh, and there's, I'm, I'm sure no less effort goes into, into uh, a $2,000 Itenoi than it does at anything else. It still gets all of your heart. Yes. I, I, today, I'm, I'm in almost in full capacity with work. That's why I can uh, make watches for 2400 and for 16800 So anyone can, can find his own... Uh, passion in my collection. Yeah. So, what is the twenty-four hundred dollar watch? What What's the name of? What kind of model is that? If anyone goes to your website, what would they be the looking for? Maximalism. Maximalism. Oh, that 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 is nice because I didn't want people to be like, oh, eighteen, that's out of my range. Five thousand out of my range. But I know you have such a great range. When you select a limit to, of one hundred and fifty watches per year, how do you cap that off? Do you just know in your mind that it's going to take me this long uh, of my time to make this model, this long for this model, and I need to only make 150 so I can have somewhat of a life. How do you determine uh, to cap it at 150 watches a year? Actually, it was, uh, um, you know, it's a process. When I started, uh, it was uh, 20, then 50, then 80 uh, and uh, recently, two, uh, two or three years ago, I stopped working with any uh, retailers. So I work only direct uh, in order to, to get to know my customers, uh, to have a personal uh, uh, feeling that we have sharing something together. Right. And they have direct uh, way to contact me if they have any questions, any problem. Uh, sometimes they WhatsApp me or uh, send me a message uh, via Instagram. So this is something that I really like. And today, something like 150. I don't know what will be in the future, but I'm really happy with this number because I'm, I'm still happy to make the watches myself and not to, to make it uh, mass production, right. or to, or to have someone else make it for me. 
So I, I, I don't, I, we can't, we got to wrap it up, but I wanted to touch on this leather on the watches because you shared with me why this leather is, feels so luxurious. It's, it, it's very light, it's very thin, but you don't actually buy the straps. You buy the leather and then you create the straps. It's just another uh, creative process for Ete Noi. Ete, where can they um, follow you on Instagram and where can they learn more about your watches? Okay, my Instagram is uh, Itai. Uh, uh, Bottom line, uh, Noi. Underscore? Yeah, underscore Noi. Uh, and of course, uh, it, you can send me any questions you want. Uh, it's also nice to visit the website, itai-noi.com. Itai-noi.com. And we can learn more about that beautiful studio. And, uh, send me questions as much as you want. And of course, uh, I, I don't sell uh, the watches. It's not a, like online store that you can click and buy the watch. Okay. Uh, you need to uh, contact me and to, uh, to send me questions. Yeah, I, I wish you all the best. I, I know you don't need that because you've already been doing this for 20 years. Um, but I, I, I wish you another successful 20 years. Itinoi, thank you so much for joining us. And it was a real joy. And congratulations on your new studio. Thank you. Shalom. <laughs> Shalom. Uh, what a joy it was. So we, next we have Rafael Granito from Formex at 1210. We'll see you in just a few moments.
Welcome, we are back with Ariel joining us uh, for Virtual Michael X on day three, and we are with Rafael Granito from Formex Watches. Welcome, Rafael. For having me. Thanks, yeah. for, thanks for coming. We, I was actually looking forward to this because uh, right here uh, in this pouch, uh, we're about to take out is the Reef, the Formex Reef, which is your, your latest debut. Uh, we debuted this in a blog to watch on the 16th, so that's when this just came out. And um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this in a moment, but before we do that, I want to speak a little bit about the Formex name and logo. Right behind you is a version of the name and a graphic that many people haven't seen before. Now, in the, in the sort of context of watches, we don't see a lot of rebrandings. Right. Uh, sometimes, once in a while, we'll see an updated logo here and there, but it's, it's a little rare. risky. It's also risky, I think. It's, of course it's risky, but I mean, one thing that comes to mind is uh, Mont Blanc, for example. Rather than get rid of their logo, they just reintroduce an old one in addition <laughs> to what they, have, what they have. I actually like the newer one a lot better than the older one. But, Raphael, you decided to go ahead and, and take... The, now, people uh, need to be re reminded that, that you acquired the Formex brand... You have, of course, history in the watch industry, but you acquired the Formex brand, and it, it, was, it started in the 90s, right, or was it the 80s? It was uh, 1999 when they started okay, and launched in 2000. Okay, so uh, not, e not even an old brand, uh, but really about a racing spirit, heavily with industrial design and things like that. Um, you know, in the name, a lot of people, you know, uh, different associations with it. Um, but it's, it's, it's actually a cool name if you know sort of where it came from. So I want you to explain to people, you know, how the Formex brand got started, why you changed it, and most importantly, now that you have changed the logo, what are you hoping people will know about the person? What is the new personality of the brand? Yeah, so the brand was founded by uh, a couple of brothers uh, here in Switzerland. They were both uh, really big uh, motorsports aficionados and... Um, yeah, they built a brand around it also with the case suspension system, which is there to remind of, of racing engines, cars, uh, motorcycles. And um, yeah, the logo and the brand kind of had for us this um, yeah little bit of a, a 90s feel to it from a design point of view. And um, yeah, when I took over four years ago, we, we started reworking the whole production, um, the, the whole models, uh, product lines. And now we felt it was time to kind of modernize uh, the logo a little bit. And also what we did with the new logo, we added a, a logo symbol um, that actually also is explained in, in your latest article, what it means and, and what kind of uh, the meaning behind the symbol is, uh, which also gives us a nice opportunity to use it as a standalone symbol on the crown, as you can see there on this model. And uh, more importantly, as an applied symbol on the, on the dial. And, and um, yeah. So if you, can, if you can't see what that logo forms, it's actually you've taken the letters the X, F and X from Formex into an infinity loop uh, and then into a hexagon. Yes. So the hexagon was always uh, an important part of, of our design, which we carried on from the, the older designs, uh, which stands for the, the case suspension screws that's on the older models or even the, the, the last model we launched, the Essence. A line uh, that you can see on those um, suspension screws. So, so yeah, we, we kind of took uh, really the DNA of the brand and, and translated that into a new logo, which uh, also features the infinity loop to, um, in order to kind of reflect the durability and longevity of, of the products we're, we're trying to build. Now, Raphael, I think that you'll agree that most watch brands, not all, but many of them, want to leverage a sense of nostalgia as much as possible. For so many brands, having an old-looking logo is a good thing, yet you, you want to emphasize modernity. Now, that's, again, not a bad thing, but was it a difficult decision to do that when you know that the competitive landscape is very much focused on history, nostalgia, classic, historic, you know, some amalgamation of these terms? I think in our case, since the brand is, is about 20 years old, we, we don't really have the... The, the monocle handlebar mustache guy <laughs> that we can that we can fall back to that is uh, you know hand filing the the anglage of of uh, tourbillon movement uh, back in the 1800s so I think it would kind of be a bit phony to to try to emulsify something like that so we're really focusing also on 
contemporary modern designs, even though if, you know, if we feel like putting in some kind of vintage touch, we'll do it, but without trying to evoke something that hasn't been there in the first place. Now, the Reef watch is the first Formex that I know of that doesn't have the, the special patented case suspension system, and I'll compare it. I'm wearing here the Essence Ligara, which, which has it, and uh, you know, if, you, if you push on the case, it's a little bit of a suspension. The whole idea was to reduce the negative effects of shock and vibration. And with the Reef, um, that has now been engineered out. And my understanding is that one of the benefits of that is you now have more flexibility in terms of design, but also this is a relatively thin 300 meter water resistant dive watch. And it's actually not that big. And I think if you look at the pictures of it, it has sort of a bold stance. It, it, it has, you know, beefy proportions. But if you look at, if you wear it on the wrist, um, it's, it's by no means a small watch, but it's, it's really great in terms of the size. I think it was, it was 42 millimeters. Yes. So, you know, you have here a nice compact case. It's a dive watch, which, you know, doesn't theoretically need shock resistance, but people wear it for a lot of sports and things like that. Tell us about some of the decision making that went on to lead to the suspension not being there. Uh, is this, is it going to continue? Is it going to be in some watches and not others? What's the future of the system? I'm actually glad you mentioned all those things you mentioned because you pretty much answered it for me. Um, <laughs> so one of the reasons is actually the thinness of the watch because we noticed in the, in the Essence line, even though it does have the suspension system, but it's uh, 100 meter waterproof, which uh, changes if you go move that up to 300, it adds some, some extra bulkiness. But people really enjoyed the thinness of the watch and the wearability, even though it was a 43 millimeter. So actually, another thing you mentioned is, is the boldness, but you know, when you actually wear it, it feels a bit more refined. It feels uh, very wearable on the wrist, which is exactly what we went for there. So you have, for instance, the, 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 the knurling of the, of the dive bezel is actually pretty big. It's pretty thick. It, it evokes a feeling of a, of a tool watch. But then when you see the refined lines on the side with the polished bevels and the interplay of the different styles of finishing, um, it kind of re evokes a more elegant feeling, and that's exactly what we wanted to go for. Also, on the, on the dial, you'll see those pretty um, high uh, indices, which go at the highest point at about 0, 0.12 mil, and then they move down. And the idea behind that was um, that we wanted to um, recreate the Riho, the, the, the chapter ring that we don't have on this model, but we wanted to create this feeling of actually having a chapter ring and it also allowed us to really deeply fill them in with, with luminous uh, material. So the, 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 the loom on that one is really strong where, where you need it on the indices and, and hands. I, I agree that uh, you did a really good job with the case and dial, but I don't want to de-emphasize the bracelet. Now, uh, at a glance, the bracelet looks uh, similar to the bracelet that is available on the Essence model, uh, but there's a couple of little differences here. So for example, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a new um, quick release system here uh, at the end link to the case. Uh, now I understand this is a patented system. Is this the first watch that this uh, quick release system is available on? Yes, that's the first one to market. There will be other brands in the future who will be using the, the, the same system. But yeah, we, we were the first one who, who released it. Oh, and um, the fact that the, the bracelet is pretty similar to, to the Essence is also a case of us listening to, to our community because uh, one of the, the points that most people really mentioned stood out about the, the Essence model line was the fact that the bracelet looked really cool to them and, and wore uh, extremely comfortably uh, on the wrist. So we kind of translated that design um, into the dive watch uh, feeling also with the, with the extended um, diver uh, clasp, which gives you about, not about, exactly 10 millimeters of micro adjustment. Well, should I say macro adjustment? Because, yeah, it pretty much replaces the diver extension, but it also gives you um, the capability of, of exactly adjusting it to your um, uh, momentary wrist size. I want to go back to the question about the case suspension system, because I think it's a great asset to the brand. And while not everyone needs it all the time, it would be a shame for it not to exist in the collection. Now, obviously, the essence is going to continue to be made, but you know, you're a watch brand. You have to have you know plans for several years. Is the case suspension system going to be a remaining um, characteristic of the brand, or is it going to be something that is going to be less and less available? 
No, absolutely not. We, we really plan to, to implement the, the case suspension system on future models as well. But I also think it's important for us being um, or focusing on innovation um, as much as we try to do um, that we have the, the capability and the liberties of, of playing around with whatever we feel like playing around or whatever we feel like um, would make our customers happy. And this was a, a decision also in terms of, of uh, product line logic that, you know, do you really need a suspension on a dive watch um, if it's a certified dive watch? Um, yeah, where we just went with, with something different, but it's definitely something that you'll keep seeing on, on other model lines or on developments of existing model lines. So I want to talk about that logo because the big news out of Formex is obviously the new reef and the rebranding. But in addition to that logo, the Formex font, if we can see, uh, well, I have the case in my hand, if we can show the case in my yeah. hand, uh, it looks like it's an italics. And then the, the font on the Formex is more, I don't know what style you would call it, but it's no longer italic. It's a, what would you call that? Like it's a normal straight? Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd call it a, a straight font. Um, <laughs> That's an original name, straight font. <laughs> yeah. So how well, long of a I, process did that take? I mean, when you and the Formex team were coming up with, let's come up with a new logo uh, that's going to accompany our new release, and let's change up the font on the Formex. How long did you agonize before you came up with in what Switzerland, we see today? In Switzerland, it's very fast. It's only 19 years. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So I was 10 when we started. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, we made it um, probably a a quicker process than it, it would be, but it took us about six months to get from mm. when we, I mean, we've been pondering about the idea for, for two years now and, you know, writing oh. down ideas, but when we really sat down and, and started talking about it, it took us about six months um, involving a lot of uh, different people that, that knew the brand and more importantly for me, involving people that didn't know the brand at all. And as uh, Ariel knows, we, we, we also, um, involve journalists and, and experts and, and give them a couple of options um, to, to see what they have to say because after all they're the ones uh, always dealing with, with all different kinds of brands so we always appreciate getting their feedback as well. Now Raphael, speaking of options, one of the things that you launched with the Reef Chronometer is an online customizer. Now you can go to the website and when you're ordering the Reef you can select from a few options. You've got um, a few different dial colors um, and a few different uh, ceramic bezel color options. And this is a great bezel. Uh, it's, it's, em it's embossed. Uh, you have here a polished top and sort of a satin finish in the middle. It's, it's, it's quite nicely done. Is customization a trend that is going to continue to be part of Formex? Is it something you're experimenting on? Because many people now, especially because you have you know, the ability to buy parts and then assemble it relatively quickly, you're shipping it directly to consumer. Talk to us about the trend of customization in general. Is this just going to be for the reef? Is this an experiment? Is this something that's going to go across the collection? In general, I think that's important to talk from a brand's perspective how this works for you. Because consumers are seeing more and more of this. I don't know that a lot of them know what to do with it. I don't know that it's, it's something that's clear to a lot of people. But from a brand perspective, talk to us a little bit about customization. I think real, um, genuine customization would be, you know, put, putting your dog's face on the dial or, or your, right, your right. children's names on the back. So I wouldn't really call it... Um, Maybe personalization? You know, personalization or modular customization because, you know, the, the bezel is a different component from the dial anyway. So nothing's set in stone until you actually assemble the, the, the final component. So we thought we might as well give the, the customers the opportunity to, to combine it. And, and from the pre-orders we got, we actually saw some very surprising uh, combinations that we ourselves wouldn't have necessarily put, up, put out there like that. But, Any you know, examples if, if of that? What surprised you? Um, yeah, probably a blue ceramic bezel with, bezel with the green dial. Oh, like uh, the way that actually, I designed it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, <laughs> which is surprising, but surprisingly looks well, but it's not something that I would have put together from the get-go. So, right, it's not a classic uh, yeah, combination. For, for, yeah, for us, it's, it offers itself uh, nicely because it's not really hard for us to do that, and, and it gives the customer more, more uh, grounds to play with when, when they actually order the watch. I think that what's also important to recognize is that the brand is getting 
uh, I don't want to say dressier, but more of a daily wear. The original Formex watches I knew about were very much sport timepieces. You know, there's no polished surfaces. It's like I, I can imagine the original people uh, that founded the brand and just like no polish anywhere here. I mean, there was some, but for the most part, it was a very industrial looking watch and, and they celebrated the industrial design of all this equipment and componentry around the world of racing. You've now taken it more into sort of a lifestyle direction, which I think really began with the essence. Um, why is it so important for brands today to have a watch that definitely has a theme, dive watch, but to also create a very versatile fashion item? How, talk to us about how important that is when you are selling watches in 2020. I think this is just a matter of, of um, personal design. So when I came in, I started designing the watches and you know the, the, the old owners m might have had a more industrial looking design as, as their design persona. So for me, I came from a product development background, um, designing, developing for a lot of uh, different brands. And this is just my understanding of what, what, uh, what um, high end looking piece um, should look like also. But also, obviously, there's, uh, there's the business side behind it where not only from a business perspective, but for me, when I create a product for our customers, I want to know that they can and they want to wear it every day, which is the feedback that we get a lot uh, from our customers. They say, you know, since I've ordered it two years ago, I've never took it off, <laughs> never taken it off, not even to sleep. Uh, which is pretty much the, the biggest compliment for me. And that's why we put a lot of emphasis on making them uh, wear very comfortably with the dropped logs. And that's also the reason why a lot of people say, for instance, the Essence at 43 mil um, doesn't wear as, as large as it looks like on paper. That's true. I have one more question, then I'm going to throw it over to Rich for our final question. Uh, going back to the business model, uh, Formex, uh, my understanding is 100% direct to consumer. Many brands these days are direct to consumer. And what, what I'm basically saying is you go directly to the brand's website or you buy the watches from them versus through an authorized dealer. The brand is now growing. You're starting to see popularity. Are you confident that the direct to consumer model is, is a good, sustainable, and scalable business approach to you? Or as you grow and get more popular, you start to feel a little uh, romance by dealing with <laughs> uh, you know, retailers and stuff, even though it can be very challenging, if not impossible, to pursue both a direct to consumer and a wholesale model at the same time. So I think it's important in the larger context of you know, talking about watches today, especially the, the more enthusiast-driven brands, you know, where they'll be, because you're not a brand that's going away. Is direct con consumer, is that the horizon for you? Or are there going to be instances where wholesale is also appealing to you? I'm not saying there's a right or wrong way, but I think consumers would like to know because it can get quite confusing for them. Yeah, I think we, we launched a brand uh, direct to consumer because that gave us a, a lot more freedom in terms of how much it could cost for us to make the watches and, and how we're going to price them to the final consumer. Um, and nowadays the consumers are getting more and more informed, so we don't have to do the, the same education anymore uh, where we have to explain every little detail, but, but a lot of customers are really well read, uh, thanks to you guys as well. You're welcome. Um, which plays, <laughs> yeah, thanks, which plays into our hand as well because, um, yeah, we don't necessarily have to put forward every single little detail, but they're going to look at the watch and they're going to be able to decide for themselves what kind of quality level level we're offering to them. But I'm not, it, nothing's setting stone. And we're actually um, started, this year we've started to work with um, um, online retailers like uh, Market Long Island uh, or Watch Gauge um, or serious watches in, in Europe. So we're definitely not against a mixed channel approach as long as everybody has their fun and also their business viability in, in working together. That's, that's the main goal for me. And, and I'm definitely not against having brick and mortar stores as well. Um, I think we'll, we'll just see where, where the journey takes us and, and whatever uh, works for us, our customers and, and eventual retailers is, is good for us. So Rafael, real quickly, on the reef, what is the price on the reef? So it comes at the, on the metal bracelet at the 1,790 US. Okay. Um, that is shipped, um, including all eventual taxes. Almost everywhere in the world, we include taxes and duties, so you don't have to deal with customs. We do that for the, for the right. customer. And um, 1,670 on the rubber strap. And, and right now, for the first 100 people, 
we, you can order it on the rubber strap, um, use uh, a specific code that you can find and get an, okay. um, a steel bracelet worth about 300 US oh, nice. um, for free with it. Yeah. And where can they learn more about Formex watches? Um, they can read on our website. We offer, we, we write um, content pieces as well where we explain what we do, how we do it, and what the thoughts behind our creation process are. And is sometimes. that Formex.com or Formexwatches.com? Yeah. Formexwatch.com. Formexwatch.com. So, Raphael, thank you so much for joining us. And I know you're going to stick around for uh, a private Absolutely. Zoom session with anybody that has a Q&A that we weren't able to get to during your segment. So we're switching it up a little bit more today, and we're going to have uh, people join in, because I know it's like 2.30 a.m. where you are, right? No, it's, uh, it's uh, 9.30 p.m. 9.30 p.m. Not, but that, it's, not that bad. OK, not that bad yet. But, it's, uh, it's before my bedtime, so. OK, yeah, <laughs> if we waited till the end of the day, it would have been too early for you. So what time is Formex's live right chat? Now, right now, oh. right now, we're doing the live chat. We put your Zoom link up somewhere in the video's description. So if anyone wants to continue the conversation with Raphael at Formex, uh, look for the, the Zoom link in the description, and it will take you directly to Raphael and Formex, Raphael. I recommend that. If I wasn't doing yeah. this, I would participate. Yeah, so would I, definitely. <laughs> Thanks so much, Raphael. Yeah, we, can, we, we can catch up on Zoom uh, next week, Ariel, <laughs> if you want to. We will, we will. It's good talking to you, Raphael. Right. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Raphael. Yeah, please do. So up next, we're going to have Daniel Hudson from Minimax Watches, and Victoria Gamelski will be your host for that.
Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Victoria Gamelski. I'm here for day three of Microlux and we're being joined now by Minimax. It's a great brand out of San Antonio, Texas. We're with the founders, Daniel and Drea Hudson, and they're actually joining us from Cancun today. Lucky you. Hi. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Drea. Nice to meet you. Hey, how's it going? It's going good. Good. Probably not as good as you guys. Is it hot and sunny there? It sure is. Yes. Yep. It's pretty nice. Awesome. Well, so Minimax is a great brand. I mean, a lot of people will know it as a micro brand that's a contemporary brand, but it actually has a hundred plus year history. You date back to the early 1900s. Why don't you tell us the history? Because it involves mul multiple continents, Spain, Guatemala, now the U.S. Yeah, it's, it's quite the, the, the interesting story about it. Um, it so dates back to my ancestral families from Spain. And uh, the, the brand started back in the early 1900s, and my grandfather was the, pretty much the founder, you could say, with uh, his father. And uh, this brand was manufactured back then by Cavani's factory, and it was a white label. You know, they had their own, so they came up with the name Minimax. Uh, I don't know how they came up with the name, but I know they, they, they sold it for, for many years. It was just stamped, just like many other brands back then. Uh, Cavani's would manufacture thousands of, of little watches. In and, Switzerland, uh, correct? Uh, yes, correct. At the in time, yep. Yes, yes. And um, they, are, they manufacture all these different models. Um, and the brand name just got stamped on it, and they sold it as, you know, as the Minimax. Uh, there was uh, they just uh, automatic movement. Oh, I'm sorry, not automatic movement. Winding movement. Um, back then, it was the interblock movement. And it sold for several years, uh, several decades actually. In, the, in 1928, I believe, the Cavani's factory went down and took a lot of brands with it, all, a lot of history. And they cranked the factory back up, I think it was like six, seven years later. Mm -hmm. But due to the incident, uh, all of those watches that had been manufactured then that were able to make it out of the factory on time were sold. But after that, they just, they, it stopped. The, the many little brands like Minimax, they just, you know, ceased to exist. Uh, my grandfather back then, he, he was a young buck and uh, he would travel back and forth to Central America, I mainly uh, Guatemala. They had, uh, Guatemala and Cuba had a big uh, 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 commerce going on back then. So there, there was a lot of travel involved, so obviously. That, and he was selling tools. watches in, in Cuba and Guatemala? Uh, no, he, that was just a means of, of uh, commerce back then. They, they weren't involved in the watch industry. They just uh, they were looking to see what other commerce they could get into. But Cuba was the 
point of entry into Central America. I see. So it's just gonna, into Guatemala. And uh, eventually, uh, my grandfather settled in Guatemala in his uh, late 20s, and his brother as well. And they started uh, to watch, uh, uh, not a watch company because they weren't making them there, but there were some jewelry and there were some watches and uh, you know, a lot of uh, fashion wear. Like retailers. And yeah, exactly. In, yes. in Guatemala so are, City, right? In Guatemala City, yes, right. And so eventually they just set roots there and they broke apart. Uh, they had some business differences and each went their own way. And that's when uh, my grandfather started the re re reborn, re rebirthing of uh, Minimax. And so he started making them again. He would bring in the parts from Switzerland, he would assemble them there. And since he was uh, a certified Swiss watchmaker, uh, obviously he could stamp it as Swiss made because of all the parts and just putting it together, just not as Swiss. But the watches were sold there for many years. Uh, I think it, they started selling in the early 40s. And my grandfather passed away uh, in February of 1984. Hmm. After that, the, the brand just fizzled out. Uh, because nobody else in the family took it onwards. And I was too young to actually get involved. Were you, and were you living in Guatemala then too, or did you? Yes, yes, I was a guy. And so bring us up to present day. In 2016, you revived the brand. How did, how did you come to that decision? Well, um, I've always been a watch freak, watch nut. <laughs> it's just been my things. And I was even a little boy. I would always go around and look at the... The, the watch stores and uh, I mean, put things on my wrist and look at things. And I mean, just, I was just so fascinated by it. And uh, I, I knew that my grandfather, you know, he had his own watch store and all that. And they, he had a brand behind him. And, but I, I just, you know, uh, I was too small. And I grew up, but I still grew up with that. It was kind of in the blood. And uh, eventually, uh, as, as I grew older, and uh, uh, it's not like I rolled out of bed one day and said, well, you know, I've got X amount of man, I'm going to start a watch company. <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard to do that. So it, it took many years to, to get to where we are. And eventually, uh, we put it all together, and uh, I said, well, I, I think it's, it's time to get on going. Uh, my uncle, uh, who still lives in Guatemala, we got to talking several years ago, and he did recall the, the brand Minimax again, and we just sparked the conversation, and I was like, well, so did, uh, did, did yeah, whether it will sell the brand or not? And he's like, no, we still have it. It's like, oh, wow, well, let me dig into this, because, you know, it's, uh, this is one of my passions that I've always pursued. And we kept on going, and yeah, the, we eventually uh, trademarked the name and the logos and everything. And uh, it, it just kind of, everything just kind of fell into place. Well, yeah. you've got these these watches, and I guess it's fitting that your core model is the evolution, because it sounds like this brand has come through quite an evolution, but this is a really cool looking piece. Like it's black DLC coated. Um, tell us about it. Tell us about this model. There's also a stainless steel version that I will show off. Um, tell us about the dial, which has some really cool, cool motifs going on here. Well, it, it took us uh, quite a bit to get to, to uh, what you're holding in your hands. Um, we, we started looking into this in, in 2016. Uh, I, I partly designed a lot of the watches myself. My, my trade is industrial engineering and uh, minor machine design. And eventually, I, I looked into several manufacturers. Uh, we had uh, several prototypes made. Uh, and, and they just they just didn't, didn't meet the, the standards that I wanted, that we wanted. And the designs were, I mean, they were good, but just, just the quality just wasn't there. So eventually, I uh, said, well... Uh, we have to go to Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> I said, just we have to... Yeah, yeah, we went to the Basel World uh, Convention in 2017. 17. And I said, we just have to go there and make some connections and interview people and look at the factories and see what they have to offer because until you have it in your hand then i mean you can talk about it all day go back and forth in emails that's that's what takes so long mm -hmm. but when you actually have it 
have a piece in your hand that you can verify, yes, this company, this factory is capable of making, they're competent and they're capable of making what we want. So uh, that's just what we did. And then- Who'd you settle we, with in terms of the manufacturer? Who makes the movement? So the movement is by, by ERA. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, 2024. I mean, it's a great looking piece. Uh, in terms of the dial, tell us about the the motifs and the way it's been engineered. That was, uh, the, the dial was a creation that was a uh, combination between us and the actual manufacturer, who's got some really uh, nice designers. It's uh, actually a factory that has their own brand, and uh, they will pay for, for very specific and unique circumstances to people that they uh, think they can devote the time to. Uh, or that they like. <laughs> we hit it off. So, you know, they actually came and pursued us uh, in Texas. Mm -hmm. They flew from Switzerland. And wow. I was like, why are they coming here? Because <laughs> they really liked us. So that, that also really helped, too. But So you have some Italian designers that have taken into, into the design. Mm -hmm. of, uh, everything of the watch. And obviously the uh, so it's part for the manufacturer. As far as the dial goes, if you look at those waves, that is actually the top part of the logo, which is like a M. -M. Yep. It, so yeah. It's just a continuation of that top. Nice. And so it just created that. That's pattern, so cool. Yeah. An ongoing pattern, yes. That comes off. And what's the price range of these pieces? Or I should say, what are the prices of these pieces? Well, we start off with the all stainless steel with the stainless steel bracelet. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and we're seeing it on the screen. Is, yeah, this will be seventeen feet. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I just love how it picks up the light. It's yeah. wrist roll. Yeah, it's got a great <laughs> polish. Nice. Yeah. It's uh, this was seventeen fifty, and the DLC is just slightly higher at eighteen ninety. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we have the one that is just. Uh, the case itself, and it's got it's a general uh, Italian leather band. And it's just leather and stainless, or leather and DLC stainless. Yeah, and, and the cases are really nice. It comes with uh, a quick change tool for the for the strap. Out of the which bracelet. he he created. Um, it's a three. It's actually a three prong. So he he actually came up with that design, as so the, you could change it yourself. As the engineer of the family. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, and so with that, the ones that are just uh, with leather, the, the stainless steel case and leather bands are eleven hundred, and uh, the DLC is eleven seventy five. Yeah, and that's pretty much the watch itself in, in a box, like what you're holding. And these are out in the world. You can where where are people buying them? Are they buying them directly from your site? Mainly, yes. Mainly C two C right now uh, online. Mm -hmm. uh, we, obviously, we had a lot of events planned this year, but. You know, Things happen. <laughs> yeah. And have you been out, I guess, being on social and trying to connect with customers? Is that yes, how a lot of uh, your year yes, has right. gone? It's, it's, my, it's mainly Instagram and Facebook and obviously word of mouth. And, uh, and I mean, we'll have our sales here and there. It's just been a tough year. I believe it's been like this for everybody in, in any industry, actually. Yes. That's what it would be. 100%. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we'll, we'll all get over it. I mean, it's okay. Yeah. Well, so and so, when were these models actually formally debuted? Then, when did they was are they? When was our launch? Uh, launch was uh, earlier this year, I believe, it was February. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. So these are really brand new. So are you working on anything yet for your next go, your next collection, anything for twenty twenty? Yes, we're we're we have different models that we're looking at, mainly the the ladies, and this is what. We want to complete the family, and because I said I'm not getting into this unless I get a watch, <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that the ladies' version um, could come out. I I would have liked it to come out this year. That was the, you know, the plan, but you know, you you still have to go to Switzerland and finalize things and all of that, and of course, travel was completely out of the question. So um, we are going back and forth. We've just started the talks back and forth of, of how I, how I want it to be. And I do want for the black 
black on black. I do want black diamonds. I'm going to have that um, on the diamond dial, diamond bezel. And um, I think it looks, I, I, I pushed for the DLC. That, yeah. that was my contribution, I guess, because I said we have to have that. Um, yeah, it's... it's really a good looking watch. And it looks great, too, with the leather bands, even the brown mm -hmm. um, leather band. It looks, um, it really sets it off. So um, I do want to do the, the ladies. It won't be an automatic. It'll be quartz movement um, out of other people's preference. Not my own, but majority of people that, you know, women that wear watches, that's what we decided to go with. So I'm hoping we can get that done this, you know, maybe get moving this year and then into next year. Hopefully we can complete it as, as well as the GMT, um, you know, maybe both of those at the same time and then just kind of complete the family. So. <laughs> Can't tell that's not it that's not us that's, that's not you it definitely sounds no. like la i don't think those are <laughs> yeah. mexican sirens um <laughs> well, so what is a, a takeaway about the brand that you feel like those of us who are watching today should know what is one key thing that you you want people to remember about mini max it, it is a, a solely owned uh, family business we, you know, obviously we're not corporate uh we put all of our passion and, and details into it. It is, we do have a service center that uh, is provided uh, at first through the manufacturer that we deal with. Uh, Domestically, uh, U U.S. Mm -hmm. So it's here. And I was in, in Europe. And it, we, we do stand 100% behind our brand, you know, the quality. Uh, if, if you really don't like to watch, if you have it, and, and you think, oh, well, I can uh, uh, I, I get, you know, jacked into this. So no, we are a, a legit brand. I mean, it stands, it, it is my wife and I, who we, we birthed the, the brand again, but it stands behind a long family tradition. And, and it is something that uh, we're going to stand by and, and actually support all, all throughout the way. The historic pieces are really cool looking. Do you still have some of those? Yes. Um, and we, we try to find them when we find them, when we're traveling. We bought a ladies one actually in Thailand when we were there in February and March. And uh, we had somebody who looked at, had bought it and they actually contacted us saying, Hey, I've got, I've got this uh, from the forties. Um, I've got a, a ladies watch. Or, do you want it? Wow. And so we met up with them. We went and got it, so we need to obviously refurbish it. And but it it's really cool because we got one in Spain as well, and it still ticks. Uh, it's still moving. It's still going. So um, from the forties, it's wonderful. It's, so uh, it's the beauty um, of we me just mechanical. Really, yeah, I mean, it's just such a great. It's a, it's a great company to be a part of, and we just we we want to share um, the micro brand enthusiasm with other people. Um, we invite people to contact us if they have a story, if they have, a, if they've had a mini max, you know, please share that with us because we really love the brand and we're just so excited to be able to bring this back to the world and the world of the micro brand. And, uh, we, we, we want to bring value back. And as you can see, if you can see the, the box, we wanted to include as, as many things as possible. And mm -hmm. our watch wallet is a new, um, is a new piece as well. Which is, um, which is what you have. Yeah. Right there. There's a and this is cool. hand handmade completely in San Antonio. Um, it's great to travel. Um, but you know, it's just, we, we just want to offer a piece of us and in, into the brand and we, we hope people can share our enthusiasm with it. So, well, they're great looking pieces with an extra sort of cool history behind them. That's, rare to find a brand like that and be able to revive it and have that family connection so i think his grandfather would be very proud oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah well thank you so thank much you. daniel andrea thank, thank you for you. being with us thanks for having and, us and I'll, uh, I'll just bring in, uh, obviously we're not in the u.s right now but uh, you can definitely have anybody reach out to us at uh, info info at minimaxwatches.com 
the questions and all that. And I think we're going to take it right now to uh, to Zoom. Little, yeah, there's going to, to be a, a there's Zoom. a link in the in the live stream that you can join if anybody wants to uh, chat yeah, with and Daniel. And we'll be here Andrea. for for a little bit. So if you have any questions, and then we'll we'll be here. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks for joining and enjoy Cancun. Thanks Thank for you. having Appreciate us. It. All right. Thank you. Um, next, we have Out of Order coming up at 1.10 p.m. So please join us.
Hey everyone, Ari Labs here with blog to watch We are back at Virtual Microlux, and joining me once again is Chad Sagres. Hey Chad, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing today, Ari? Good, today you've, you've taken off your lederhosen. Last time you were with us, we were talking about Laco. <laughs> And today we're talking about not a German brand, but an Italian brand, Out of Order. And you are also uh, the head of North American distribution for Out of Order, or OOO, if you will. One of the things I find very interesting about Out of Order, in addition to some of the playfulness uh, that the watches have, which I think is really great, is how Out of Order sort of became popular in the community. And it was a little bit different than many of the other brands. It really started its popularity uh, through Watch Gang, who worked uh, very heavily with Out of Order, um, you know, getting watches for the Watch King subscribers and sort of took on a little bit of an identity. Before we talk about some of the watches here, which are automatic versions uh, of Out of Order watches, tell me a little bit about sort of the recent history, how the brand sort of came into, into the popularity, what people liked about it, what did Out of Order do correct? Um, let's hear a little bit about the story. So, you know, Out of Order was founded in 2013 in uh, Sendona Piave, just outside of Venice, Italy. Um, they were a relatively small brand. They sold to boutiques and uh, traditional distribution. About five years ago, I started working with Out of Order when I found them at Basel World. And uh, we started a relationship of bringing them to the U.S. And the thing is, is it's a youthful brand that I feel like the way to break into the U.S. was in a modern way of doing online distribution, really focusing on building a community around the brand. So in terms of the community around the brand, there's, there's a lot of people that have tried this, but what is it about the brand? Was it the price? Was it the design? Was it something about the personality? I think what I'm trying to go for is explain what resonated with consumers. So I think it, it was the playfulness of it. Um, lots of colors, lots of variations. We control our manufacturing and production in Italy. So we're able to make small batch limited editions at an affordable price for people to collect, um, which makes it really, really, really unique. And that the whole identity of the brand is to be a little more, a little bit humorous and more playful than most other brands out there for a watch or a traditional watch companies. So let me ask you, you like watches. You and I are both you know, avid enthusiasts. We have conversations all day long, high end, low end. One of the things about this brand, like we said, is some of these playful statements. I'm going to mention what some of those are. But my question for you is, is you know, that doesn't work for everyone. How, what, what is it that made it work for here? Is it the price point? I'll, I'll give you an example. Okay, so everyone um, who is not familiar. So the first thing here, I'm, I'm holding up this part of the box, and it says, damaged in Italy. Okay, a, a playful statement, not necessarily something that most brands would, would want to say. I'll, I'll explain why that is. Um, here's the Swiss Automatico. And on the back of the watch, um, it says, uh, please treat me bad, right? So the idea is, you know, go out and, I don't know, you know, do sporty things, like throw the watch around. Uh, this one also has on the, on the inside uh, of, the, of the bezel there, on the, on the inside you can see it says, um, do not cook spaghetti uh, for more than uh, eight minutes. So... <laughs> This, you know, I guess it's, it's a joke because people use the, the rotating bezel sometimes for that. Also, it's an Italian brand. How can a brand get away with this stuff where so many brands in this very conservative luxury space, always worried about not looking silly? How does a brand like Out of Order get away with that? Um, it's funny because some of these things is I even kind of go, wow, how did, how, how did we get away with that? Or why did, or, but I think that that's what makes us our identity. And it's just a, we don't really care about the serious traditional way of doing the watch business. We want to have fun. These are a lot of these pieces, myself, Ricardo, and the team that I have order work and design on. And we're very proud of them. And it's very about being playful and having some of our own things that we want to see and our identity in those watches. You know, Ricardo um, Terizi, the uh, head of Out of Order Watches, is a very unique person. Um, he is out of order, <laughs> I would like to say. <laughs> you know, he's, a, he's a, a, the stereotypical Italian character that you can imagine that he is. And he's like, comes to me, he goes, Chad, what do you think if, uh, you know, Rolex writes a uh, Rolex on theirs, why don't I tell people how to cook spaghetti? And I'm like, do it. <laughs> I like Let's how it goes from Rolex writes brand origination. How about we talk about cooking spaghetti? That he connects the two. In his mind is kind of amazing. In his mind like that. 
it, it's it's so amazing. <laughs> and and you know, I go usually to Italy quite a few times throughout the year to work without a border, work on designs, work on ideas for the collections and it's always an inspiration and so much fun being there with the team there in Italy. So let's talk about the damaged in Italy part and you are of course a witness to this. Um, I think the implication is that these are watches that, that fit in sort of the, the pre-worn. So we were actually talking with about Laco the Erbstruck. Similar process, um, more affordable of course, different technique, but the right. idea is the watches and I'm taking here the uh, the orange colored version of the the, the Swiss one I automatic have right here sitting in front of me. Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, there's this one has a little bit less than others, but there is you know some some special scratching on the case, things on the dial and stuff like that. This one actually seems to have less than some of the other out of orders I've seen. Um, tell us a little bit about why the community is interested in this sort of fashionable distressing, if you will, and what it is that out of order does right because. Again, my understanding is that one of the things that made them popular is that this was one of the most affordable ways of getting that, that sort of pre-distressed look. It is. And, and, you know, I think it's what it is, is it's a different customer than the traditional customer who's buying an out-of-order watch. They're really looking for something that is unique, that is individual. It's a bit of expression of art. And it's also like a tough, manly, heavy watch that I think that that's what people are looking for, something that they can really wear, not worry if they hit it off something, not worry about, you know, if they're going to break it. And that's the whole thing about out of order. It's kind of a, it's, we've already beaten it up for you. Um, I would put it compared to like uh, buying distressed jeans, like diesel or like golden goose sneakers where if they're pre-distressed sneakers, actually both diesel and golden goose are from the same province region in Italy as out of order. So it's kind of funny I guess in that area, they want to just distress things. So it's a, it's a cultural uh, preference of the aesthetic. Yeah, it's, and, it's, and it's, a fashion, it's, a, it's a fashion statement. Now, in terms of designs, a lot of the designs, at least the current watches, are, I'll say, reminiscent of other popular watch designs out there, even though a lot of the personality and playfulness is, of course, unique to out of order. But as the brand grows and progresses and matures, are people going to see more of an emphasis on original design? So we do do a few original designs, like we have the torpedo cases and we do some other things. I think it's, you know, in the watch industry around watch sells beyond any other watch and people are always looking for watches that look familiar. So when you're building watches that you want to sell watches for people, it's good to stay in a realm of that possibility. But we do work on all the new designs where we have a lot of cool projects coming out in the next year. Um, we're really focusing this year um, about creating limited edition small batch things for our fan base, for our memberships, for people who are out of order enthusiasts. Um, I know people who buy every single model of these, so we have a very good following in that way. Fashionable they are indeed. And let's, so let's talk about price. So in my hand here, I'm holding a limited edition. This is the Ghost 3.0, and I'm imagining 3.0 because there's a little picture of a ghost on the back with three eyes, which are the out of order logo. And this is a limited edition of, I believe, 41 pieces. And you said the dial has been specially rusted and it looks pretty cool. What was the price of a limited edition watch like this? So the, that was $1,000 and that had the ETA 2824 movement in it. Um, we do those usually, this is the third version of a ghost watch. Um, I designed the first one about four years ago. And then we've been doing them ever since. This is the last of the ghost watches that we're, we might do one more, but I don't think we're What does to ghost it. imply to... exactly? Just a fun name. The, okay. the first one was a little more going towards the ghost. This one's very unique with that rusted dial. That dial took forever to make. And pretty much the only reason we made 41 of them is because why not? That's a weird number to make. Uh, <laughs> So the, the brand is almost trying to challenge many of the conventions that exist in the watch industry. And, and you're right, when it comes to limited edition numbers, these numbers are often arbitrary, but brands try to have a reason for it. You know, um, let's use number eight because it's an auspicious number, you know, in, in, in China. Let's focus on a number because it's uh, an anniversary or something like that. But in reality, as we know, oftentimes these numbers are arbitrary. And, it, and maybe the brand is, is sort of musing on the fact that there's a lot of 
serious arbitrary things. I'm using that intentionally in sort of a contradictory way that the, the seriousness that a lot of the brands put on these numbers is in fact arbitrary, whereas out of order is, is again, musing on it and, 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 and laughing a little bit about it, you know, the, the jokes on the industry. But at the same time, as the brand matures, it then has the responsibility to, like we said, be a little bit more original, take a little bit more responsibility, and it can no longer ride on some of the coattails of this is a popular design. It's going to have to grow up a little bit. So the question is, how do you think a brand like Out of Order can mature, become more serious, but also retain the playfulness and the sense of, of you know, being lighthearted that many people seem to enjoy about the brand today? So I think the, the for me and the one thing that I've been really pushing with out of board of the last two years, and uh, you can even see this is um, stepping up our quality as being a real professional watch making company that every detail in our manufacturing process is done at the highest level that we can do with keep, with staying in our price range. Um, we made in the new collection that came out in 2020, we made a lot of changes, um, colors, looms, different crystals. We were really moving the brand to being a very high quality timepiece at an affordable price. But then you're right. We have to find our own identity and we have the distress look. We have a lot of the unique pieces that we make, but we are working on things that we can develop new cases, new styles. So let's, let's focus on that because I think it's very interesting from a business perspective. You, you became popular because of a certain fan base that loved what you did, loved the price, maybe wasn't so concerned about things like the material that uses Illuminant. Now, as the brand is maturing, naturally you say, okay, everyone, we've got something popular. If we make a better watch, we might appeal to more people, right? More, yeah. more traditional enthusiasts, people that are a little bit more experienced. Does that model tend to work? Is that correct in the sense that if it worked for this number of people here and then you make it a better watch, does it also appeal to these people over here? What do you think? I think it does uh, because when I moved all the quality up and when Ricardo and the team in Italy, when we changed all the collection, we kept the price in the same level. We didn't, we didn't do a huge price increase. Um, we, we came to a point in our manufacturing where we could order from better manufacturers because we were having larger orders. Um, and that we could hire better service text because we're selling more watches. So it allowed us to grow because and stay in the same price level, which is what is important for our customer base. Now you mentioned the limited edition had a price range, <clears throat> excuse me, a price range of about $1,000. Um, the Swiss Automatico that also has the 2824 movement is on a bracelet, slightly different uh, That style. one has the STP. Oh, this okay. has the STP. Okay, yeah. well, uh, it's, it's similar same. performance, similar yeah. performance. Um, so the, the STP based one, not limited edition, different colors. There's the blue, there's the green, the orange. I think there's sort of a black one as well. What is the price point of these watches? These are around 710. Uh, 710. Retail. So yeah. is that going to be sort of the rough average of a mechanical uh, out of order with a Swiss movement? Or is this because you keep saying focus on price point, which I think is fantastic, but if the price point is moving around, I think a lot of the average consumer isn't going to know what price point you're going to start to hover around. So anything with a Swiss movement um, in the Automatico collections are going to be around seven to $1,000, depending on the production and things like that. Unless we're going into a GMT, which we are actually looking at making in the future, or a chronograph. Um, but we don't we do have entry level automatics at around $400, and that's with a N, uh, NH35 in those ones and with Miotas for a little bit lower price range as well. But I feel like those are, people are buying all of them. They're not just buying one or the other, they're buying the Quartz ones, they're buying the Autos, they're buying the Swiss ones, they're buying the limited editions. So our collectors and, and generally the people who once they buy one out of order, they seem to have two or three of them. It's interesting because you, you like the look of it, but you think to yourself, well, this is orange, I'd like a blue one to match my blue, so I can see how there's sort of a fashionable stickiness. Um, we're almost out of time, but my final question is this. What does Out of Order do moving forward to keep the novelty of the distressing techniques interesting and feeling inspired? Because at some point, if you do the same type of um, distressing techniques, uh, those collectors that are looking for that novelty, well, they'll look elsewhere because it's the same thing. So what are some of the plans to maybe incorporate new materials or new techniques to, to give that damage in Italy look um, even in more variety. 
So we do all the all those are done by hand. The damaging process of these watches, and which makes them all really unique pieces. Um, we did do things like the ghost there, where we took out a dial and we had that dial rusted, uh, made a full rust dial, and we're looking at playing with different materials um, and developing new things over the next few years. You know, one thing is really going to be interesting is uh, our GMT collections, which uh, we're basically making all those are going to be limited editions, and we're changing cities and colors very very often. When they sell out, that's it. They're not going to have numbers on them, but when they sell out, that's it. Okay, that's very interesting. So out of order watches is probably one of your most uh, entry level uh, accessible points for the sort of distressed look um, with the mechanical movements and some of these fun designs. There's a lot to look at. Um, you'll have to be able to, you'll be seeing everything on the out of order website. Chad, thank you so much again for joining thank us. You. Uh, we're gonna take a little bit of a lunch break here and we're gonna be back with Talker at 2.20 p.m. Thanks so much for joining us at Virtual Microlocks. Again, I'm Ariel Adams with Block to Watch.
Welcome up, welcome back everyone to Virtual Microlux. We are back with Sophie Rindler from Talker. Hi Sophie, how are you? Hi everyone, I'm doing great. How are you? You're not too tired after three days of non-stop interviewing? Well, all the people we speak to are energetic because they haven't been doing it for, not, for three days. <laughs> so we, we, that, that just keeps our energy up, you know? Um, no, but actually it's funny because you know, you, you've gone to the watch shows and things like that. And those are more than three days, and those are more meetings than, than we have on, on any given uh, occasion. Um, so this is actually relatively relaxed for us. So yeah. having, having the watches here, not having to drag around a bunch of uh, uh, camera equipment, stuff like that, um, I actually prefer this. I've always said that like at the shows, there's no more Basel World, but we just need to set up an office and just bring the, bring the watches to us. So this is kind of our, our dream come true, and, and for you, this is a great alternative to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Um, hmm. It's very hard to argue with an alternative to nothing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very hmm. compelling. I think it's been really great that we've had so much positive feedback of trying to, to do our best to make sure that we have um, you know, an ability to have a, a, a show or some type of yeah. selection these days. Um, Rich, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what... We're getting some mic disconnected here, sorry. This is what happens in the live. <laughs> this is the beauty of, of live, you know. <laughs> Don't get the mic, I'm back. man. I'm, I'm back. There you go. There we go. Sorry. We had, hey, you know what? That is, that is just proving authenticity, yeah, right? This I, is, I this is not the here. eBay authenticity promise. This is ah, the micro yes, right. authenticity there promise. Is authenticity promise. <laughs> yes, a bad... A bad a battery change, not something you need to worry about on most, but not all of the talker watches, because there is a quartz That's one here. But if anyone says, why would I want a mechanical watch? No, no embarrassing battery yeah. changes. Um, so let's, <laughs> let's back up and talk a little bit about talker. So I think the, the thing that, that begins my perception of it is it's started by a guy named Austin in Austin. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. <laughs> how, did, how did you, I mean, you're, you're, you're an early person on the brand. Tell us a little bit about the formation of the brand as well as what your role in it is. Yeah, so Austin and I are really the two uh, owners of the brand. Um, we have a different percentage of ownership because um, Austin has been funding the brand. So he's got, you know, more of the ownership, let's say, figure. But we started this together. Um, in 2016, we met through a common friend. And um, at first, you know, I wasn't sure where he wanted to go with this because it was really his idea. I was myself working on my own brand at the time. I remember. Um, which was the Rindler brand. I think I did show you some renders you did, back you then. Did, yes. yes, I did in California, I remember. Um, and so it was a little bit difficult because I had on that on one side Austin who wanted to do something came to me for advice. On the other side, I was already working on something. And I just decided to make I had to make a choice. I just couldn't do both. And I just felt that as a woman and, you know, also I'm not that much of a business person. I'm more creative and I have ideas and I can come up with tons of things. But as far as like business plan and working the finances, I'm not the best person uh, for might, myself. I might, you might say that you actually are. I've gotten to know you. <laughs> but, you know, I just didn't feel like I had the shoulders to do it on my own. And I'm so glad I didn't. So Austin and I decided to partner and to launch this together. And that's what we did. And uh, we started, uh, we launched a brand. Actually, our, our third anniversary is coming in just a few days on the 27th of October. Congratulations. That's when we launched. And, and in that time, the brand has released a, a, a very prolific number of watches from sort of traditional tool style watches, all the way to um, some of these more wild watches. This is the, the color dipped version um, of the chronograph. Yeah. And uh, this has been something which has been very successful for you. You take a traditional watch case and there's um, a layer added on top of it that has a whole variety. This is sort of a tie dye looking one I have here, which is sort of a marbled black and white one. Um, I guess I, I'm just I believe the one you have, I, I believe the marble is the Hydro Loom. Hydro this, this Loom. This one is a, the entirely luminescent case. Okay, so that's, I, yeah, I didn't I didn't even know that. So I guess the first question I want to ask and I want you to talk about is 
At what point did the brand go from making traditional style watches, you know, from sort of American perspective, because it's an American brand, um, obviously with Swiss movements, to, hey, let's just go wild, fashionable, um, and everything in between. Tell us about that process. Well, the truth, Ariel, is that this is what we started with. We didn't start traditional. We started with this. Oh, yeah, that's right. And yeah, the airplane engine. Yeah, the radial engine inside the case along with the wing, which was completely unseen before. And, I mean, we have that insane, crazy case that has the shape of a wing on its side with this radial engine. I see. So we started as a brand that had something to say that was different from other brands. And what, was, what, we, what really made us become so enthusiastic about the brand and about the project together with Austin is that it came from a true story, right? So it's really Austin's grandfather that was a, a, a soldier during the war, that was a pilot that flew those planes and that was going back and forth in China to help with, uh, with the allies over there. And um, so the, the story is real. It's his grandfather who was a pilot. Then his father is also a pilot. And Austin is also a pilot. So right. This, this is that, this whole authenticity behind what we're doing. But then we are also young, right? I mean, young people, I would hope so. <laughs> Considered young. <laughs> we still got it. <laughs> we still got it, Ariel. Um, so I wanted that. Oh. But also... <laughs> It's a young brand, right? So uh, someone earlier, I don't remember which brand it was, but I re it, it resonated with me, said, why are we going to go into the very traditional anglage of the Torbjörn watch when we really don't have any of this in our history? And, and I, I agree with this. You know, we don't really want to make up something. And being in the industry for that long myself and being so familiar with brands and the collectors because you know i'm kind of wearing many hats i know that people excuse my french don't like bullshit and we didn't want to be a bullshit brand we always said we have to remain true to ourselves to who we are we're not pretentious like you will never hear us start talking about ourselves like mega celebrity and mega stars because that's not who we are we don't like that we're humble we're nice people we're real and that's what we want to be. <laughs> so you, you talked about Austin's uh, family military background. It, that must have been a play in factor with the D-Day, right? This, this has military ties. Um, you also give back to the military with uh, a portion of the sales of this. And when did the D-Day come up? Because this is actually one of my favorite kind of cushion designs uh, that we have here. Yeah, the D-Day was a fantastic project because it came to us. It, we didn't go to them. Um, after we launched the radial engine, which is really the C-47 plane, and the C-47 plane is the plane that is represented into that watch because it's the, that's old brother, and that was a C-47 plane. So we've been hashtagging on our post from the beginning, hashtag C-47, right? Because that's what we're doing with this one. It turns out that the, the husband of the CMO of the, uh, the CAF, the Commemorative Air Force, He's a watch person, and he saw our post. And he goes to his wife and tells her, you have to, check to, to talk to these guys. They're in Texas, and they're doing a C-47 radial engine in their watch. There is the 75th anniversary of D-Day. You have all these materials sitting there. Why don't you talk to them? And that's what she did. She reached out to us, thanks to her husband, and this is the rest is history. Well, we, okay, we went to the CIS and decided to really go into that project together. And part of the dial is actually made from a real part of the plane. That's how you, that's what the dial material is it's made. It's actually not even part of the dial. It's the entire dial. Mm. The whole thing is taken entirely from the aluminum of the plane, which was very challenging because we did that in Switzerland. And, you know, a dial, it has to be flat. <laughs> but a plane, it's kind of curvy. <laughs> so <laughs> yep. there was a lot of work behind it. I want to back up a second and talk about the, the Texan part of the brand now. And I can ask you this because, um, uh, unless I'm mistaken, you are not originally from Texas. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. how do you know? <laughs> Here at Microlux and, and, and in general, um, we've been talking to a lot of brands, startup brands, that are out of Texas, especially 
out of Austin. And yes, there's lots of little startup brands in, in various parts of America. But I wanted to ask you, what is it about Texas, especially cities like Austin and Dallas, which is making it so ripe for this mechanical watch entrepreneurialism? Try, try to explain this to people. Well, I, you know, I think, and it's, it's funny that you're asking me this because I'm kind of the French here. <laughs> so I have a very objective perspective. I hope so. Um, yeah. I think what, what, what's happening is that Austin is a vibrant city and Austin is extremely young, very dynamic. You have the, this big music festival and it's a city where you have a lot of people from California moving to Austin because California is too expensive, as you must know. And many big companies decided to have some, some uh, presence in Austin. So Austin is young, vibrant, and very dynamic. Dallas, on the other hand, is more conservative. It's, prob it's very wealthy, um, which means that maybe some brands have found some easier way to find investors because, you know, Texas has money. Um, but it's also a very big state. And it reaches out to a, a big population, not to be political, but you have the red and the blue in Texas. Um, you have the people for, that are very much into guns, and you have people that are very much into democracy and into other beliefs. And so it's if you like guns together. and democracy, you also <laughs> like watches is what you're saying. Well, I, I shouldn't say democracy, because democracy is everywhere. But you know what I mean? It's like some more conservative and more liberal. But thing. do you agree that it's sort of interesting? Because the things that you're describing, like youthful and vibrant, that's not how I would describe most of like the watchmaking part of Switzerland, right? These places That's are right. definitely not vibrant, and of course there are young people there, but these are conservative, old-looking places. Um, what is it about the culture there that is it's not only entrepreneurial and has that access to the investment money, which of course is strictly necessary if you want to make something like a nice watch, but how are they even coming into watches to begin with? Because what we're noticing is there's people that didn't grow up with watches, who are sort of right. discovering watches, and some of them are becoming business people in watches. Like, you know, Austin, uh, you know, I know him, and he's beyond talker, he's a watch collector. But it seems to be something that sort of he and his father got into. I don't think that he had this sort of like long history of like, and my grandfather taught me about his Patek Philippe. You know, like, there's, <laughs> there's this, not, just like no. me, I mean, I'm not from Texas, but I had to learn about watches myself. Um, you know, it was sort of this autodidactic, um, way of getting into it, and, and I'm noticing that a lot of other people are following it there. But again, as someone who is not Texan and, and also not, you know, American, um, tell me a little bit some of the conversations that they have there that would that, that leads to the direction of I might want to make a watch. And again, they're also very original. You see, you don't see a lot of uh, I'm sorry to say, like a copycat watches or ones that are a little bit, you know, more derivative or things like that. There's this enormous amount of, of pride. I know that that Texans are known for having an enormous amount of pride in their state. Uh, in their cities, right. and their yeah. teams, and things like that. You but, know, is there something to do with that? Just uh, let's just talking more about the culture. I think helps understand some of the ideas yeah. behind the brands and the designs. Well, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's not necessarily just Texas. I think it's America. I think the U.S. has become a player in the watch landscape. It turns out that Texas is the biggest state in, state in the country, so you will have a lot of people there. It's also a wealthy state. Uh, but if you look at the if you look at the U.S., you have brands all over the place. You have brands in Miami. You have Liv in Miami. You have brands in New York, in Brooklyn. You have brands in Minnesota. You have brands in Philadelphia. Like really, I feel that that the U.S. is just like a little mushroom that is just <laughs> popping everywhere. Interesting. It's it, 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 Texas to me is, I mean, it's I, I don't want to say it's a coincidence, but. I think the commonality with Texas is that you have um, a population that, unlike what people think of Texas, maybe from 20 years ago, that were like these from like Dallas. You remember like the the TV show? Who shot these Jr. Who shot Jr. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> remember that? They still wear big um, hats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think people don't realize that Texas is actually super cool. I went to Texas. I didn't know Texas. I had the, the worst idea of Texas as like a French snob. <laughs> to me, it was like a bunch of rednecks that just, you know, would be on their pickup trucks and, <laughs> and wouldn't, wouldn't know anything because that's, that's kind of how it, it's projected. And I know a lot of people from the East Coast that are thinking the same thing, but from the older generation. 
But if you look at Texas today, the new generation of Texas, of Texans, is like us. It's really cool people. So yeah, maybe they, they come from money because they are from a state where there is a lot of oil and there were a lot of success business stories and good for them. They have money, but it doesn't mean that they are um, the, the old way. And I think the, the beauty of Texas is that with that kind of money and with that kind of energy in the state and not everywhere, I mean, you won't see that much going on in Houston, I think. Um, I think like, you know, mo the, the, it's mostly Austin and Dallas. Um, and, and, and I think it's just like, you know, when the co you have the coast, the east and west coast, you have a lot of culture. And there is a lot of culture in Texas. That's so, interesting. Which, so, you know, I came to discover myself. I, I mean, there's probably a lot of uh, ver very good answers in there in regard to what is it about the American culture that um, makes us so interested. And you're right, where there's money, oftentimes people end up finding watches. Now, you look at the dials, it says Swiss made. So I think the second part of the question is, how are the Swiss and the Europeans reacting to this? Um, you know, just a few years ago, there really weren't these American brands. And of course, there were some of the big groups, the Fossils, the Movados, Timex, and things like that. But they weren't right. doing these little indie things. When these brands go, and again, you have the direct experience with Talker, and they go to Switzerland to get parts made, to get things assembled, to buy movements and things like that. What is the Swiss reaction to all this American entrepreneurialism around watches? Are they excited about it? Is there some protectionism? Like, whoa, 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 you can only charge this much, you know, but we have to reserve the rest of this technique and craftsmanship for our things. Tell us a little bit about the sort of today relationship between the American watch entrepreneurs and the Swiss companies that are traditionally designing and making and, and distributing these timepieces? So we have uh, only received amazing feedback from the Swiss. And look, it, we also have a Swiss in the team. I mean, Serge, our CEO, CEO who is now, he was based in Geneva, has been managing the brand out of Switzerland. So he's the one that handles all the project developments and has all the contacts. So that probably helps. I'm French, so I speak French when I go there. That's very helpful. But I have to tell you, there is a fascination from the Swiss and from the Europeans in general with America. It, it still has some cachet, I would say. Um, and for them, there is a Lucky pride. There is a pride. <laughs> <laughs> panache. <laughs> there is a pride as, as Swiss uh, movement makers or Swiss um, suppliers there is a pride to know that their components are going to be um, building a watch in the biggest country in the world, like, you know, in, in their mind. So a country that has the economy, a country that has a lot of collectors. And we know that from, from the auctions and other um, events that happen in the watch world. Americans are very present in the watch landscape as buyers, collectors, enthusiasts. Red Bar was, was created in the U.S. and it's everywhere now. So America has a, a big presence for it's an the, important uh, market. For the it's def America is it's definitely huge. an important market. Well, it's still, you know, I think, and again, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I do think that America still has the largest volume of watch collectors and still is the most influential place when it comes to many things, including watches, meaning what's popular in America tends to translate well in other places. There's very few products that just do well in America and don't do well yeah, elsewhere. Right. But there's plenty of markets uh, where things do well in that market, but you bring that to the U.S. and it, it doesn't work so well. So as an American company, how does that influence some of the design decisions or colors? Or if, if, is, if it is, as I guess, America's so varied, you have no idea because somebody might like blue, someone might like pink, and you just try to throw out as much as you can, knowing that the market is big enough to absorb potentially all of it. No, we don't, we don't think like that because um, we, we have a very thorough uh, thought process when it comes to what we want to do and how we want to do it. Um, you know, the hardest part when you have a brand is to successfully dissociate your own psyche and your own taste and what you like from what you know will sell. And it's very difficult because, you know, when you are a watch You've got to give an example. You've got to give an example. Okay, take the Hydro Dip. Okay. This is, this I'm, is, I'm this going is to take it and not give it back. <laughs> <laughs> the Hydro Dip was a very bold move right? Because you're looking at it, it's acquired taste. 
and it's also on a very big watch. So you, you go into the market with something like this. Is it going to work? Is it something that we should be doing? We love it, but does it mean that people are going to like it? I personally didn't like it at first. I oh, just thought it was too crazy. And, and I just don't see myself wearing a Hydro Dip. Austin loves it because he's that kind of mind that just loves stuff that is totally different. Well, we so are, as Americans, that. known for being a bit more open-minded than the traditionalists in Switzerland. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a very hard, it's a very hard choice. And, and, you know, even for the future collections, we like something, but does it mean that the market is going to like it? So you have to think, you have to study, you have to research, you have to run some market studies, you have to ask around, you need to see what, what is being done, what is successful, what isn't. Um, also, you can't compromise with quality, right? We had e quality issues at the very beginning with the choice of our suppliers, and thankfully, we caught it very early on and changed the movement, changed the case design, changed everything to accommodate. Um, so to answer your question, Ariel, we don't throw out everything and see what's going to stick because we can't afford to do that. It's very expensive to do this. Yet the brand so has been have... very prolific. And, and if you look across, you know, this, this model right here, the, 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 the chronograph of this big, bold case, you've done so many versions of it. And I, and I say that in a positive way because the variety is great. I almost, you know, in putting myself in the, in the shoes of a consumer, go to the website and say to myself, I don't know which one to get because this one looks cool. I like that dial. Um, you know, that's one of the hard things about buying watches online. When you have a lot of variety, it's hard to choose that precise one for you. Um, do you ever feel sometimes that the collector base that you, that you sort of acquire and that you engender can sometimes get, I don't want to say frustrated, but if there's so much variety, they're like, but I just bought that awesome one and now you're coming out another one. How do you balance making sure that the consumers are, are happy with the volume coming out and, you know, producing enough to meet, you know, business objectives? You know, this is such a good problem to have. <laughs> 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 it's like my favorite problem. Oh my God, I want it all. So the way we do it, first of all, we didn't release all of them at once, right? We, we really started with the basics. The first um, chronograph that came out were the black one, the blue one. And um, then we started to do some very small series, limited editions of the green ones. We have two different greens. One is the Hulk and one is the Silverado. And those were only a hundred of them. So we limit, you know, the amount of watches because we can't go crazy either. Uh, like you said, there, there is a cost. And so the, the truth is that the cost, when you change a dial, the dials are not that expensive. What's expensive is everything that goes around the marketing and the team and the overhead. That is more expensive than the actual watch. And people don't realize that. You know, people say, oh, yeah, that movement costs X. So that watch should not be more than 200. I'm not saying more than 300. But they don't realize all the work that goes behind it. Um, that was just a parenthesis. But back to what we were saying, we, we don't release everything at once. And if someone really, really loves another one and they already have one, they can talk to us. Like we would, we would definitely work it out with them. If they want to do a switch and, and, you know, put more and put some money on the new one, that's not a problem. And that's the beauty of micro brands is that, or independent brands, because, you know, sometimes you, you just don't know exactly where to situate yourself. But is that we, we are independent. We can do whatever we want. We, we are people. Like, we can talk to each other, and we can talk to our clients, and we can work together with them. So, so I'm not too worried about having too much to offer. No, it's good. I think it's just an important question to ask as a consumer because some people begin right. to get into a brand, and they start to follow, but before they buy, they want to make sure that they're getting you know, the one that's right for them because, you know, watch lovers are detail oriented and maybe that shade of green just isn't perfect. Maybe another one is coming. So I think it's good for people to know a little bit about the, the volume that's coming out so they make a decision. I want to go back to uh, the various types of colored cases and things like that because the brand has now found that these are successful and I assume there's going to be more of them. 
Um, but it's always been traditionally very difficult to apply colors and things like this to cases. Coatings um, can have durability issues and things like that. Now that I think you believe this is going to be a bigger part of the brand, how are you improving in the technology to make sure uh, that these cases, even though they're colorful, are as strong as possible, are as durable as possible? Talk to us a little bit about some of the development which is going to come in the next few years there. So the thing is that the company that does all this, um, all this work is Tech et Bosch in Valorb. They are the ones that are actually working on the technology. And they have been working uh, over the last two years in improving the coding, improving the, um, the, the, the way that the, the uh, material adheres to um, not just the watches, but they just started now doing it on other material like, like fabric and other leather and other uh, different material. And they have been working on improving the technique and improving the durability. So I would say that maybe from the moment we started, it was already pretty advanced in, uh, in the, um, uh, the uh, durability and the solidity of the, uh, of the technique. I think that today it's, it's much improved and I believe that they, we are at the level now where there is no, no more improvement that can be made because it's actually really, really good. So I'm and not, it's working on every material. Good to know, Sophie. Thank you. Yep. So I have the green one here. Now, I'm not going to try this, but if I was just to rub my fingernail across this, this is not going to scratch. It's not going to do any harm, correct? So just so you know, this is a coating. This is not ceramic, right? So, and, and we keep on telling that to people. It is extremely resistant. And there is a PVD below the watch. The watch is, is burnt into the coating of PVD and then the, the, the bath and the dipping. So if you scratch it with your nail, no, it's, nothing is going to happen. But if you take it and you scratch it on a wall or on a concrete wall, yeah, it will scratch. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you throw it on the floor, it will chip. But it's not because of the coating. It's just going to happen no matter so what So you don't have to be super cautious. You don't have to worry no, about no, no, no. your you wool can, sweater you can, scratching it or... Um, you know, you, no, if you have you extra long have nails, right. if you have a you Texas have sized truck, you can run over it is basically what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> you, have a, you have a new collection that is debuting uh, now or very soon. It's a day date model and uh, it's so new that we don't have any here, but I'd love to hear. But we do have renderings. We do we have, have some images. We have do some, have we renderings. Have picture. We've yeah. seen pictures. Let's nice. get those debuts showing. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> while we're showing them, I think that the audience will see some of the screen. Tell them what they're looking at. Oh, that's nice. Okay. So right now, so maybe you can't see, but this is the, the green dial, uh, and now we're changing the tan dial of the, of the day date. So just talk this talk through talk oh, us through okay. this. Okay. No, yeah, because I don't see right, I don't right. see on the screen what you're seeing. Uh, so wait, the reason you don't have any is because we don't have any either. Like we are actually waiting for the samples, and uh, we should have the samples by the end of the month. We wanted to do something that was. Um, we, we, we redesigned a case. Like you can see that case is completely different. New it's case, extremely, right? It's a new case. To me, I find it very wearable. Size? It's a 41. 41? Yeah. For, for men and women. It's a 41 millimeters. It's much thinner. It's like the 13 uh, or maybe 13 and a half uh, millimeters. So it's, it's a thin, like flatter case. It's well, it's like, that's not usually thin, but blood. compared to the other ones, that's very thin. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we were like at the 14, but it might just be even less. I don't have the exact specs. So that's something that I need to research a little more, but it could be less. It's, it's a thinner, much thinner case. Now, there's, um, there's two versions of this. One version has a yeah. more standard dial, and it has right. the, the, the day of the week window at the 12 o'clock position and the date at the 6 o'clock position. But there's some that have a, a skeletonized look. Explain why these exist, are these special, are these different? Um, talk about the skeleton. That is cool, version. that is cool. Yeah, so Talker, we, we have always positioned ourselves as innovative, right? Innovative from the first day with the radial, then we did the D-Day, the, the, the D which was innovative in itself because of the way the dial was made and what it was made of. And it was the entire dial, not just parts, like some other brands took a little piece of something. We did the entire dial. And the hydro dip, and then the hydro loom, which is something that nobody has done before. So we don't like to do things that everybody does, right? A day date, okay, you've seen day dates before. It's a very, it's a solid movement. It's the STP day date movement. So we're very happy about it. I actually visited the manufacturer um, a month and a half ago, and I was very impressed with what I saw. 
which, you know, was contrary to what I had heard, which was interesting. It's in Lugano, uh, near Lugano, right? No, they are in somewhere in the middle of Switzerland. Like, we had to pass Neuchâtel. Oh, for um, STP? From Geneva, yeah. Okay, I guess they have different facilities. Um, I want to I um, go back just for a moment, because the, the, the two things that we had common themes going on was that Tucker is a newer brand and, and the Texas uh, talk. I think as, even though Tucker is a newer brand, I think it has a heavy presence because I started noticing it in the uber luxurious Neiman Marcus department store, which are actually coincidentally, or not coincidentally, I should say, headquartered in Texas. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah but, that's why. That's why. That's exactly why. <laughs> that's the only reason we went to Neiman Marcus is because they are based in Dallas. <laughs> yeah, but it is not an easy brand. feat to, as a newer brand to get into Neiman Marcus. I mean, that, that's an extraordinary, that is not easy to do at all. How, what did Tucker do to be able to convince the Neiman Marcus buyers that said, hey, we're, we're going to take a chance and we're going to carry your product even though we carry some of the most extravagant uh, designers out there? What, what sold them on Tucker? Sophie. They liked us. <laughs> Sophie joking. could be. No, for real. You wore That's their clothes true. probably. And they liked us. They liked our vibe. They liked the fact that we knew their business. They liked the fact that we... They were at the time, uh, there's also some, another component, and then we can go back to the day date, because I really want to tell you something about that day date. Uh, there is another component with Neiman Marcus, is that their entry-level watch were, watches were Shinola. And they were looking for a better brand than Shinola, because <laughs> at the time, Shinola was not doing automatic. And they were looking for an American brand that was doing automatic watches at the entry-level price that they were comfortable doing. And we showed up at that moment. It was serendipity. We were American. We're from Texas. Cool people. Austin is a big client. That always helps. <laughs> he knew one of the managers of the store in Austin. Uh, I'm in Miami. Miami is really big for Neiman Marcus. We have like five or six down here. And, um, and, and we had the products that they were looking for, literally. So it, it was a perfect, literally, like the stars were aligned and we started the relationship with that. Well, real quickly. The situation now is a little different. Real quickly. So what, what is the price range of, of a Tucker's? Because I think if people feel that, oh, if Neiman Marcus carries it, it might be a little expensive. So what is, yeah, right? what is the, the average price range? What is the low end to the high end? So for now, the least expensive we have is the quartz version that is not at Neiman Marcus, but it is nine, $990. And that's the a really special series done in partnership with the USS Battleship Foundation. Um, and then the chronograph starts at 1600. The sky train starts at 1200. And then we have the bronze model that is a little more expensive, but still, um, I would say 1700, so okay. it's below 2000. And the hydro dip is the most expensive one at 2350 and, at tw and a little more for the loom, gotcha. 3200. So it's, it's kind of a pretty wide range. And that's, the new that, day date. That's within, that's within the spectrum of, a, of you know, a, lot of, a lot of the comfortable prices. Yeah. Sorry, so you were yeah. saying about the, the price of the day date? So the new day date, the reason we did two completely different models, and we actually are taking advantage of being here with you. This is the first time it will be released ever. We haven't shown it to anybody publicly. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and, that's, and we were very excited, actually, too. And we rushed it. Remember, I mean, it was hard for me to get you the images. I remember. Because we had to get them at the last minute from the actual um, uh, designer. But we, uh, we wanted to do something that was easy to wear and that was something that would not be complicated. So the first day-day model with the simple, plain, let's say, dials, they're like more of a traditional look but has the military feel because we want to keep this going with the khaki dial and the cream. Uh, I say cream, but some people say ivory or off-white. That is, that is more military styled. And we have different options of indices. Some are showing all the indices, or some as are just nine and three. And then we have the day on top and the date on the bottom. But then we're like, come on, this is nice, but it's not talker. It's not talker enough, <laughs> right? So we said... <laughs> Okay, let's go crazy. Let's do what we actually like. And to your point, what we were saying earlier, Ariel, is like, okay, we like it, but doesn't mean other people will. And we decided to completely like destroy the day date and make something that had never been seen before. Because from my memory of my knowledge of watches, I don't think I've ever seen a day date featured that way. 
And it's, again, something that we like about to do, like to come up with something that people haven't done before, which is not that easy in this industry. Or if it has been done, maybe it was like a long time ago. And we decided to make it crazy. And we, 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 um, we, we want to call it something with code. We don't know yet because it looks like a code, like you have to, to decrypt. Um, but it's a new way of showing a day day that, that is more interesting, that, that is kind of playful, kind of fun because you, you guess everything without really seeing it. But then it comes together on the top and the bottom. Oh, it's, and, it's and we fun. wanted to see how people were responding to this. So right now, today um, is the, 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 the debut it's the of debut, these new yeah, It's the models. visual debut. And I remember... We're I, actually going to give one away. Oh, we're doing no, I, I wanted to interrupt you to that because we have the, announce, the winner and we should announce it now. Are you Wait, ready? Okay. okay, so hold oh. on. Uh-oh, hold on. Hold on. So we have two giveaways. We have the giveaway we're doing now, right? But then we're going to do another giveaway of the day date. And that's going to be on our Instagram where people are going to comment what they think about it. And we will pick a random winner when on November 3rd. Why? Because at least one person in the country is going to be happy that day, which is election day, because they will win a watch. Okay. So that's the goal. So let's get to the winner. Um, and the winner for either the black dial chronograph or the new SkyTrain is Juan Sanchez. Juan Sanchez, LA Microlux, we'll get to you. Congratulations. Yay, congratulations. So you get to choose one of the two, Juan. You can Correct. choose either the chronograph, which is going to be uh, the black dial full stainless steel bracelet, or if you want something a little smaller and you like blue, then it will be the SkyTrain with the blue dial. Wonderful. So Sophie, we are out of time. I think that we're, there's going to be okay. a breakout session with Talker. Thank you so much for coming. Go to the Talker website. There's lots of Talker coverage on the blog to watch. Uh, Sophie, thank you so much for coming to uh, You're welcome. And go Microsoft. to our Instagram to play so you can win the day date. Do that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take care. Next, we have, we have Victoria about to host Alan Sale from Sale Baltimore coming up at 3.05 in just a few minutes.
Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Victoria Gamelski. I'm here with Alan Sow. He's founder of Sow Baltimore, watchmaker founded in 2017. They've got a few cool models here. We're going to talk to him. Hey, Alan, welcome. Hey, Victoria. Thanks for having me. Sure. It's great to have you. So Baltimore, not a, not a place we typically think of as a hub of watchmaking. What, tell us about the brand and how you came to found it. Yeah, so um, I love the city, Baltimore. So it started in 2017. Um, it really started with obsession with watches. Um, I kept buying more and more watches, and they kept getting more and more expensive. And then one year or one night, I was on the computer about to buy another watch. Then my wife looks over at me. She says, Alan, you're about to buy another watch? Stop buying so many watches. Why don't you just start your own company? So I had to thank my wife. Uh, she's really the inspiration to all this. But uh, my background's in design, marketing. Uh, and I guess my first watch was when I was 10 years old. It was a nice orange fossil watch. So uh, I played with it. Took it apart. It was just a quartz movement. Um, took a while to put it back together because I was 10. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty but good. But it was fun. Uh, then I kept going uh, more hands on things and then start designing watches. And then one thing led to the other. Created the, the first model, the Founders Edition. Uh, launched it on Kickstarter. It did really well. Um, and then went with the next model, the Torch Diver. So, the models are kind of focused around Baltimore because I love the city and I want to have a different connotation of what people perceive Baltimore as, uh, you know, with all the negative news out there. But I want people to see that some good things happen in Baltimore and South Baltimore, is, I hope, is one of them things. Uh, that's why a lot of our pieces are inspiration in Baltimore. So our second model was called the Torch Diver which is named after the USS Tor submarine that's located in Baltimore Inner Harbor. Uh, we worked with the historic ships in Baltimore uh, with design and we actually donated about $5,000 to their organization to help their uh, you know, manpower, help make sure their ships are in play, intact and everything. And then we have the Constellation, the Chrono Diver, um, which was named after the USS Constellation that's also parked in the Inner Harbor as well. Well, cool. Well, we've got a few of these here. In fact, we've got two of the Constellation models. So let me whip out this cool. And you mentioned orange. Yeah. Um, is that a is that an ode to your your so, first yeah, watch? You know, Baltimore. You have the Orioles. You have the Ravens. So you have different various of colors. So. Sorry, the plastic on this is making a little sticky sound. But anyway, so this is one one version of the Constellation. You want to yes. tell us and tell us about the movement as well. Is it their their chords correct? Yep, so that's the Constellation Corona Diver Panda. Um, I also call it a different thing. I call it the flashlight because it is a full loom dial. And uh, when it is, uh, you know, you're in a dark room, that thing glows like crazy. So that is using a Seiko Mecha Quartz movement, uh, a very good, uh, accurate movement, uh, grab and go. Um, so we've just played with different aspects, you know, price ranges. We wanted to have an affordable timepiece in different ranges that everyone can, you know, take on. And the Chrono Diver was one of them to be more in the, uh, the affordable uh, timepieces without removing the high quality uh, in terms of materials and aspects of it. And what's your, what, what is the price range? So the uh, Chrono Diver is 450. Um, and that's, we did initial pre-order on our websites in February and yeah doing pretty well in sales. Fantastic. And are all these available on your website? They are. they are. So they are available on the website. We also are working with two retail companies. If you're local around uh, Maryland or in Pennsylvania, uh, we have a retail partner called Nelson Coleman in Towson. Also a retail partner in uh, Pennsylvania, Hanover, uh, called Garrick Jewelers. Great. Well, that's, yeah. And it, do you find that there are people interested in that heritage, interested in looking for a piece that's hyper-local. Absolutely. So, because um, with South Baltimore, I really want to create a community. Um, it's not just a watch. It's not, you know, just another piece on your wrist. It's, it's something that you can be proud to wear, something that you enjoy looking at here and there. Um, you know, 
something that has a story behind. Uh, like with my pieces, whenever I buy a watch, I want the story. I want to be have a connection with the piece. And that's what I want to create with all my pieces, is to create that connection between the person wearing it and the watch itself. And, well, carrying on with this sort of love letter to Baltimore that you've got mm -hmm. with these pieces, this is the second Constellation model we've got. So tell us about this, a brand new colorway. Yeah, so that is our newest colorway for the Constellation Chrono Diver. Uh, we just put it on our website. That's called the Midnight Gray. Uh, so the difference with this is it's a, uh, it's a very dark gray dial. The sub dials loom uh, with Super Luminova, but the indices are actually old rhodium. Mm. So it has a, a vintage look, but uh, still a modern twist to it. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the indices yeah. there. They do look, that's what it is. It, it almost looks, yeah, a little, a little gold, like a... Like an old rhodium. Like a room. retro gold. And uh, those pieces actually also come with two bracelet or two straps. It comes with the bracelet itself, mm -hmm. as well as the Kevlar strap as well. Yeah, and we see the orange is sort of a theme throughout. You've got oh, the yeah. lining. Um, fantastic. And what is, is there a different retail in this one? No, that's the same price, 450 Okay. And then we've got a legacy piece here. Um, we do. Tell so us about the legacy this model. piece uh, that was we've been teasing some things on our Instagram about the legacy piece, and we're really excited about this piece because this is this has been a really interesting year, um, you know, with the pandemic. <laughs> but there have been some good things. I mean, this year actually will be I'll be a father this year in uh, December. Oh, congratulations! So, I wanted to create a piece that was that I could pass down, that, that others can pass down, to create that legacy, to build something, and I wanted this this timepiece to you know showcase the quality, the hard work that's involved in creating a timepiece like this. So some of the photos that you're seeing on the screen is uh, one of the most uh, the coolest colors is probably the purple, which we call it the Raven because of the Baltimore Ravens. Of course. So we call it the Raven. So it's currently, the legacy is currently utilizing a Salida SW200 movement. Uh, but we are actually in the works of uh, working on a Maryland assembled movement. Um, wow, that's so, a big deal. Yeah, so we're working with some other brands local to Maryland, uh, Edgar Watches, McDowell Time. Uh, we're all figuring out ways to do something more in-house. Um, so this piece might be one of the first pieces to utilize a Maryland assemble movement. Uh, so we're going to test, we're currently testing uh, and depending on the results, if it surpasses the Salidas in terms of power reserve, accuracy, reliability, then we'll be using the Maryland movement. If not, then we'll be using Salida movement, which is also a great movement. Uh, in addition, so this is the our three-hander. We're actually also going to do a legacy GMT. So the GMT is going to use the SoProd C125 movement, which is a great movement. Um, and we're also going to be doing a 36 millimeter uh, legacy. Uh, that's going to be housed with different, uh, it's going to utilize a Miyoto movement for now. Uh, the 9015, which is the movement we generally used in our previous uh, models. And it's going to have a variety of different dial options as well. Yeah, oh, fantastic. And currently the legacy comes in, is it the green and that great raven? So the legacy will come in, let's see. So it also there's a uh, there's the raven, the purple, there's the green, there is a gray, and there's also a blue variant. Uh, the dial's all vertical brushed at, to match the case as well because the entire case is also vertical brushed. It has a dive extension class, quick release pins, and it of course it comes with that watch roll that's actually on your table right Yeah, now. no, it's a nice looking roll. And sorry, I can't recall if I asked you, what's the retail on the Legacy? So uh, we're, we're probably gonna pre-order it, uh, probably launch it officially in February. Mm -hmm. um, probably gonna start around the 650 mark for the three-hander and about 850 for the GMT. Great. And they are gonna be super limited. Um, for the three-handers, we're probably going to make 50 to 75 in each color variant in uh, steel, as well as there's also a bronze ver version as well. I think um, we're looking yeah, I at it. I should show yeah. you that now. This way. Oh, look at that. It's a l oh, almost there. Yeah, it looks great with, yeah. the, with the purple. So 
It's uh, so we're doing bronze as well as steel. And then uh, once that, that's also going to be in GMT as well. So GMTs, we're only going to make about, uh, let's see, possibly 25 of each, each color variant. So that's going to be even more super limited. And so who have you found, and you've been around for a few years now, what have, you know, who are your kind of core clients? Who are you, who's your target customer? So our, our target customer, I mean, I'd like to say Maryland, Baltimore. Um, that's obviously the target audience, but, um, you know, watch enthusiasts, people like, you know, a quality watch, quality timepiece. Uh, we've shipped around the world. Uh, I just put a shipment to uh, Qatar. Um, wow. Yeah. And then how'd the, they, how'd they the still UK. Want you? Yeah. So it's everywhere. And I've had shipments to Maryland, to California, everywhere. So um, it's basically anyone that's looking for a quality timepiece, you know, that wants a piece that is more than just a timepiece. It has a story behind it. Do you find that this renaissance in American watchmaking that, do you feel a part of that? I, I guess I would date it to maybe five or six years ago, mm -hmm. perhaps with Shinola coming back to the fore yeah. or mm -hmm. coming to the fore in 2014. Um, yep. Did you look to other American makers and think, wait, I can do that? I have, yeah, I have definitely. Um, Shinola, I, I guess when I started, I was kind of looking into Shinola as well. Um, and that's kind of where it all began. Um, I mean, if they can assemble their pieces over there, then why can't, you know, I could do it here in Baltimore. Um, so just did a lot of research, uh, made a lot of contacts, talked to several different people here and there, uh, other micro brands. Um, you know, it's, it's a really nice community, uh, you know, talking to other brands, picking each other's minds, seeing what's out there. Uh, what they're doing, what's what they're having issues with right now, and it's it's a nice community, and it's it's great to be a part of it. What are the issues? What do you think is the most difficult part of this process for for a microbrand? Um, I say exposure. Um, the whole microbrand things, you know, being in the being a microbrand, um, I feel like everyone knows what a microbrand is, but being a microbrand, we're only you know a small percentage of the entire population of what they know of. Um, so it's being able to educate others to go beyond the fashion watch, to go beyond what you see at a Macy's or a Nordstrom and to look into your community and look into what businesses or small businesses are doing, you know, what these independent or micro brands are doing, because we can provide a higher quality piece uh, for about the same price or less than that. So it's just educating consumers to making sure that they know what a quality piece is. And how's your Instagram game? I'm sure that's a big part of it. Um, it could be better. Uh, sure we could all but, say that. <laughs> yeah, it could be better, but it's going well. Um, definitely something. But uh, we're actually going to start, uh, I'm going to put a program up on our website. Uh, we're going to start doing uh, some scheduled uh, Zoom calls. So if you're interested in talking in person, I could wave some some watches on the side so you can see it in person as opposed to you know having to go to a store or anything then i'm going to be having that scheduling on my website so that people can you know talk to me in person uh get to know me get to know the brand get to know the watch and hopefully create that deeper connection with it that's great um well we've got just a minute or so left so before we say goodbye what what is one takeaway one thing you want people to remember about south baltimore other than what um, the, the city in its name, of course. Uh, we have quality timepieces, uh, custom. Uh, we're super proud of our pieces uh, from design, the concept, to the people wearing them. Uh, I want to really thank all our supporters. Everyone that has purchased a South Baltimore, everyone that hasn't purchased but has provided some great feedback. Um, we wouldn't be here without you. So I really want to thank everyone for the incredible support. Oh, that's great. Well, it's so nice to meet you, Alan. Thank you, you so much for Jordan. joining us. Yeah, thank you. Well, best of luck, and uh, next time I'm in Baltimore, I'll check you out. Thanks. Yeah, let me know. All right. Take care. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Next up at 335, we've got Heim watches. See you soon.
Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Victoria again. I'm here with Zakir Mia. He's founder of Haim Watches and he's joining us from Chicago. Hi there, welcome Zakir. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great. How's everybody doing? I hope everybody's doing well out there. Yeah, I think we're all managing. Everybody's kind of winging it at this point, but figuring it out. So I, you just told me just before we, we went live that your brand is brand new. I mean, as, as new brand as... New. I would say I am the, I'm the newborn here out of everybody that's gone <laughs> so far in the past three the, days. The baby. Um, I would say the 28th of October would officially be one month. That's, congr that's great. Congratulations. That's so new. Well, so you come from an interesting background and tell it. We, I just heard a little bit about it, but I definitely want to hear... And I want our, our watchers to hear today where you're a transportation industry specialist and what brought you over and decided, hey, it's time to found a brand, a watch brand. Well, you know, Haim started off as a passion project for me and originally, and it's something that I've been working on for a bit over a year now. And really, I've just started to put all the pieces together. And, you know, I've been collecting watches for actively, if I have to be exact, about 17 years now. And I have a variety of pieces, some that are fairly entry level, some that are priced mid tier, and some that are very, um, very high end heirloom pieces per se. So, and you know, when you're collecting different watches, you're holding them, you're spending time with them. Next thing you know, you, you see like, okay, hey, I wish this watch would have this feature, or I wish that watch would have this feature. So when it came down, I decided, you know what, I want to put a watch together that will check all of my personal boxes in a watch. And that's when Haim was born. And that's when the first model, the Legacy Chronograph, it started to come to life. We've got, we've got one, of the, uh, one of the legacies here with the, the Sky Panda. I think you call it the Sky Panda dial. But tell us, what were those boxes that you wanted to check that you were, weren't finding all in one, one piece? I wanted to stay within a certain price point. So for this, I wanted this watch to stay sub 500. Also, I wanted it to have, because most watches within that sub 500 category don't, either they'll have plexiglass or acrylic. So I wanted to have a sapphire crystal. I wanted to have 100 meters of water resistance on it as well. And I wanted the finishing to be fairly, to be comparable with a higher end watch. So with this one, if you see there, it's a sunburst finish. There's multiple Pantone colors together, which creates different color hues based on angles. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, if you see the hour markers, they're applied indices. So I wanted something that really stands out. And if you see the dial, if you see the chapter ring, I put the tachometer on the chapter ring on there. So it had some depth to it too. Yeah, for the, I can notice the indices for sure and the ring. Um, and, and I love that it says Chicago, Illinois right there on the dial. So is this, do you feel like, especially for, for fans and natives of Chicago, uh, are you promoting it that way as a Chicago-born sort of Chicago-born <gasps> brand? Well, you know, most watches will normally have their origin on there, whether where it's made and such. And with this one, the origins are European and Asian, but everything was designed in Chicago. Final assembly will be in Chicago. All of the testing will be in Chicago, too. So this was a, a nod to the city. I'm a Chicagoan, born and raised. So that it's just a personal nod to it. Yeah. Well, I think people, people in my experience, are when they like Chicago, they love Chicago. So to have a watch that says, says the city name on the dial, I think it's just a, a plus. So there's a lot of fans yeah, of that city. It's a curse because if there's people who really don't love Chicago that way, they'll kind of stare at it like, oh, I'm not sure if I, if I want this. I think most people at least like Chicago. It's a pretty cool city, so not bad. Um, and so tell us about the, the movement. Tell us, I mean, it's got a really great exhibition back. I don't know if you can kind of see it here, but. Yeah, let's see if I can hold. I have the other one here. Yeah. So this one is the reverse Hunter model, which is a uh, Hunter green per se. Mm -hmm. And this one, it's really interesting to photograph because every picture you take, it's going to come out different. The shade will come out different on my Instagram page. Uh, there's plenty of pictures on the Instagram page and you'll see as far as the reverse Hunter one, each photo, the green has a different shade to it. So this one, the movement itself, it's the ST1901. And that movement was selected for a few reasons. One, my, when I designed this, my non-negotiables were two things. One, it has to be a manual wind movement. I don't want a rotor. I don't want an automatic movement. And two, it has to have a column wheel. 
<laughs> so now my choices were between a Valju movement, a Seiko chronograph uh, movement, and the SD9. The Seiko, it's automatic. It's not manual wind. The Valju would really put me out of my price point. So the ST1901 made the most sense. And also just from my own personal collecting and use of the movement, I, I have a couple watches with the movement in it and it's been years now and the movement has been very reliable. Okay. So I feel confident in the movement. That's great. Well, with 17 years of collecting history, and it does sound like you really covered the gamut, but were you drawn to, as a collector, any specific types of watches or specific features? You've named a few, of course, that you wanted to see in this, but... Yeah, what's your kind of ethos as a collector? So as a collector, I feel variety is important to have a variety, whether it's casual watches, a go anywhere, do anything watch, um, a dress watch. So a kind of those elements to roll them all together in this model. So this one, I wanted this watch to be something where you can go from the beach to the boardroom, from the from the boardroom to a night around the night night out on around the town. Yeah, it has a nice sporty feel, which I think these days, if you want an all-around watch, a nice sporty watch will make sense in the boardroom also. It, it's not like you just need a dress right. watch Right, and for that. the dimensions of it. The case itself, it's 39.5 millimeters, 47 millimeters from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. The lug itself, the lug width is 20 millimeters. I went with 20 just because, again, from a strap, from a variety standpoint, there's a ton of straps out there that come in 20 millimeters. So for people who want to change their straps, this would be... This one's a strap monster. You can pretty much fit, you can find any strap you want in the 20. That's great. Well, so coming from a collector background, what has it been like to actually be in this industry, in this business? What, what is most surprising to you about being looking at it at watches from the inside out? Well, if I put my enthusiast hat on, one, I feel that I don't want to compete with anybody. I feel that this whole community as a whole there's enough for everybody to try to leave their imprint. And I just don't want to compete. I consider everybody my friend, everybody who supports the brand, a friend of the brand. And I, I want the brand to be very personal to you. And I want that personal touch where I'll reach out to people, myself individually, and just ha as hands-on as I can possibly get for a company. And with that, my all the designs again are something that I would make for me. If I am if I'm not certain that I want this in my collection, I'm not going to go with it. So that's my enthusiast hat, and I also acknowledge if people people can have a variety of brands. You don't have to necessarily just stick with Hain. You can have any brand you want. I mean, I have my own personal favorite brands that are not Hain, and that's perfectly normal which is one of the reasons why if you see the packaging for the legacy comes in a box, you open the box, the watch will be packaged inside this travel roll. That was great. And with the roll, you can hold either two small watches or one larger watch. And whenever I travel, I carry multiple watches with me. And even just during the pandemic, if I've been working from home, I'll change my watch four or five times a day. At home. At home. Now that's a devoted collector. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only pee in that pot. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, especially and, if you're on a Zoom, you want to jazz it up. <laughs> right. Well, you know, business at the top, sweatpants at the bottom. I know that well. I definitely know that well. Well, so what's next? What I mean, you, you've just launched, so we can't expect too much from you, but what are you thinking for 2021? For 2021, I have some tricks up my sleeve, and I don't want to get into it just yet, but... Right now with the legacy, we're in pre-orders for it. So I'm accepting pre-orders. And once this gets rolled out, the quantities, I'm limiting this, this model to 150 pieces per color. And the reason for that is, again, my putting my enthusiast hat on, the two things, one thing that from watch collecting is accessibility, but also exclusivity. So I want something that I know is fairly limited. And that's just me speaking for myself. So, I'm sure some, I'm sure other people feel the same way. And with that, this would be a watch that's not going to break the bank, but it will be limited. You'll have something special that not everybody can have. Right. With only 150 And pieces. I, from a business structure, I know for a small company, it's probably not the best, but again, my enthusiast hat on, my collector hat on, I have to, I have to go with it. That's my business model. Every model that I will have a limited quantity. 
And so right now they're available for pre-order. And so your main channel is obviously your website. Right. So if you go onto the web website, you can pre-order. Production's already happening. So everything should be completed towards the end of December. And that's when I'll, I'll do all the final assembly and testing and such. So I hope to get them out sometime in January. Now, on the website, I have February. And again, with the pandemic, things are a bit uncertain. So I wanted a bit of buffer room. Got it. And um, hopefully I'll be able to under-promise and over-deliver. I guess that's always the dream, right? Right. <laughs> the, the dream. Um, so you, you, we chatted a little bit, and you mentioned that you'd had this idea about a year ago. So what has this year been like for you? And I mean, did the pandemic derail plans, or did it give you time to sort of sit with your thoughts a bit and, and create something even better than you might have had, to, had, had, had you been forced to sort of meet a production date? It's given me it's given me some time. So I've been able to come up with a lot of different drawings and a lot of different designs. Um, for this model, I've gone back and forth a few times before coming out with the initial prototype. And I would say it's given me some time, but also as far as coming out with it, I feel I feel with the pandemic, it's helped as far as a branding, as far as branding goes too, it's just been, I have the, I have the time now where I can reach out to people, where I can build with people. And especially through Zoom, you can meet people all across the country, all across the world without having to go anywhere. So I would say it's definitely given me a bit of an, a bit of an advantage there. Yeah. It's always strange to talk about silver linings with such a, you know, a terrible event, but, but I think a lot of people have found them and I think that's healthy. And it has given people a lot of time to just sit, sit and think and sort of, you know, not rush around so much and, and lose sight of the things that matter. Um, and so are you, are you on social or can, are you sort of ramping up your Instagram? What, how are you yeah. communicating with people these days other than obviously? Well, I have a mailing this. list and the website is www.hamewatchco.com. Same thing for Instagram, Facebook, it's at hamewatchco. And I encourage people, reach out to me, talk, let's talk about watches. It doesn't have to be my brand either. It can be any brand. I just want to talk watches. Yeah, you sound like, and how did you even get to watches in the first place? You said 17 years ago, was it well, one as watch? A kid, that... As a kid, I've always been fascinated by it. It started off with the Spider-Man watch, then it became the Casio calculator watch. And then of course, throughout high school, it was a bunch of, fashion brands, so Fossil watches and DKNY watches and such. And eventually I saved up and I was able to buy my first quote unquote real watch around 2003. What was it? It was a pre-owned Submariner. Great. It was a new, a new to me Submariner. So that was the first one. And since then, I've just been down this rabbit hole. Has it been mechanical? you know, for you mostly since then, or have you? I prefer mechanical. And I know from, from a business point with Haim, I don't, I don't think I'll ever dabble into quartz. It's just not because my own personal preferences, I don't, I personally don't prefer quartz movements. It, I would prefer anything, whether it's automatic or manual wind. Mm -hmm. Now my favorite, of course, is manual wind. How come? What is it about? Is it the engaging with the watch every day? Then? Engagement. You know, we're so busy. We're so busy throughout our days. And the time that you spend winding up your watch, that 30 seconds or so that you wind it, it gives you a chance to connect with your watch, to really spend time with it and to be hands on. And when you know you, when you think about memories that you've experienced with your watch, it all comes back during that 20, 30 seconds when you're winding up your watch. Yeah. It reminds me of my first mechanical watch, and um, I loved it, and I still love it. It sits there. I'm sure I could get it going again, but it stopped on my birthday one year, and I was like, that's it. It's an ode to my birthday. So <laughs> I just left it there. I should probably jigger it around, see if it still and works. One other thing to point out, so if you see the bracelet on it, it comes with the, it comes with the beads of rice bracelet. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, for all pre-orders, all pre-orders as an added bonus, they'll be getting a Milanese bracelet with it, too. Great. So you get two bracelets. The two bracelets and the travel pouch. Yeah, which is a good looking and obviously yeah. helpful thing once we all hit the road again, hopefully soon. Um, we've got just a minute left. Any final takeaways that you want people to know? You know, I would appreciate every. I would appreciate the support. I appreciate those who've been on board already. And again, once you support Haim, you're a friend of Haim. You are a friend until 
there's no way out at that point. <laughs> You're, so, it's like Hotel from, California. From a business standpoint, I want to do something different that hasn't necessarily been done before. I want to try to be as interactive and engaging as possible. Once things get better with the pandemic and all, I want to get on the road and really just start meeting people, meeting people who are a fan of the company Neat. and just getting to know everybody. And again, thank I thank everybody for their support. The The support means the world to me. Pre-orders are still up. And again, it's, it's ready. It'll be ready to go sometime in December. And just thank you. Well, on that note, on terms of uh, supporters and collectors, we've got uh, the, we, we know who won the Haim giveaway. It's Scott Breaker. And Scott, if you're watching this, uh, Microlex will be in touch. They will find you and figure out a way to get you your Haim timepiece. And for anyone who wants to chat with Zakir, after today's programming, we'll have, there'll be a, a link in your live stream and you can join and just ask any question you want. I'm sure Zakir will be more than happy to answer. So thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to meet you. Best of luck. Thank you. All right. Well, next up, we've got Feynman. And at, that is, uh, let me see here and check my time, 4.05 p.m. We'll see you soon.
Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Victoria again. I'm here with YK Lim from Feynman Watches. They're based in Singapore, so it's quite early uh, Monday morning. Welcome YK, yep. it's great to meet you. Hey, hi, hi Victoria, welcome everyone. Yep. Yeah, thank you for getting up nice and early for us. Yeah, yeah it's uh, pretty good sunshine, yeah. <laughs> Well, so tell us about Feynman. You you were established in 2017. You had your first release, the Feynman One, in 2018. What's your history? How how did you come to create your own brand? Okay, so so for those who are following us, they, they would probably already know, right? So Feynman is actually uh, my son's name. So how this brand came about was uh, actually uh, I was trying to look for a kind of a, a watch to customize uh, for my son's uh, birthday. So I was thinking like uh, maybe I should create a customized watch uh, to pass it down to him. Uh, because as watch collectors, this is I think what most people would do for their children. So while going through the whole process, uh, we ended up uh, deciding to create a, a whole new brand instead of just, just a single few pieces of watches for it. So that is uh, in, in short how, how the Feynman Timekeeper's uh, brand came about. So. During the whole process, uh, we somehow managed to, to, to come up with the idea to design a whole new watch uh, with my son's name as the brand itself. That's how uh, Feynman Timekeepers came about. Yeah. How old is your son now? My son is uh, five. He's turning six soon in January. Yeah. Oh my. Is he pretty excited to have a whole brand named after him? Um, for him, uh, he still doesn't quite understand that it's his brand. But uh, he recognizes his name. So whenever he, he sees like uh, the shirt or the the watches, you say that that's my watch, right? Because he recognizes his own name on the watch. Yeah. Oh yeah, and it's yeah. a cool name, a very cool name. Mathematical evocation there. Um, so tell us about the Feynman One, your first piece. What was that like? Because yeah. so, we we have so, your second maybe, piece here. Yeah. So uh, before we talk about Coke, uh, I would like to go through the Feynman One first because that's our very first release. Uh, for the whole brand. So Feynman One uh, came about when, uh, like what I said, we were trying to look for a, a watch for my son. So um, as a watch collector myself, I, I used a little bit of uh, kind of bias opinion on my side that uh, I wanted the watch to be a hand wine and I wanted it to be a mechanical kind of watch. But uh, at the same time, because uh, I'm using uh, my son's name uh, as the brand, I, I do not really want to create something that that is that looks something similar in, from the existing market. So what we did is that uh, I I talked to a few of my collector friends and we came out uh, with some ideas and also I, I engaged one of the uh, watch brand consultants. So we actually came up with an idea like uh, we need a, a mechanical hand wire watch, but at the same time uh, I wanted the dial to be something. Uh, very kind of unique, which is uh, what you will not probably see in a, a kind of so-called micro brand uh, section. So at the same time, we want the, the quality to be there because after all, it's, it's supposed to be a legacy piece, right? The purpose of the watches is to for you to be able to hand down to, to the next generation, right? So uh, we wanted it to be very robust and, and the design that could be 
still uh, good looking at the same time uh, still modern looking in the maybe the next decade or the next few decades when we pass on uh, to, to our children so that is where we came out with the design that uh, you can see on the on the youtube video now so we took the hand wide movement which is the top grade the ita 7001 movement and we rotated the movement uh, about uh, 45 degrees so that, that creates a, a very kind of a, uh, asymmetrical kind of settings Off whereby center. you have your sub seconds at the uh, on your left hand side when you have to watch and then your crown is at the four o'clock instead of three o'clock so this this kind of creates a uh, something for people to talk about and think about why do we want to do this right so at the same point in order to balance the dial right we actually develop a 3d logo plate on the right hand side so this logo plate actually balances the, the whole equation of the subsequent on the left to to make the dial uh, looks asymmetrical and symmetrical at the same time so it's, it's kind of a, a a design where i want people to to think hard about how, how it came about. And at the same time, uh, we make use of the, the commonly used uh, uh, golden ratio, which is actually, it's not something new. It has been used in, in other brands like Langa, Gashuta. So uh, we make use of the same concept of golden ratio to create the, the circles that you see on the down, right? So every circle uh, has a golden ratio towards the smaller circle, which is uh, the, the architecture design that people use to, to, to make buildings and uh, architectures at the same time. So it's, it's actually kind of uh, ties down to a lot of details within the DAO. So uh, it took us about six months to conceptualize the design and about nine months to really came out with the prototype uh, that we are happy with. So at the point of time, uh, when we first came out, uh, because it was so new, right, the brand. So we actually held an event in Singapore to showcase all the watches to get feedback and uh, get the ideas uh, from uh, some of the watch collectors, local watch collectors uh, within the enthusiast group in Singapore to, to gather the feedback and at the same time to uh, do some benchmarking whether uh, our product is uh, of uh, the quality that they expected. Because uh, we, to be honest, we are not the cheapest brand in the Funko brand. What industry. was the Feynman One Cheap. priced at? What was that retail? The Feynman One is actually priced at about a uh, thousand US dollars now. Is it so available? Yeah, definitely. Still? Yeah. Is it still available? Uh, currently, for the Feynman One, we have sold out all the colors, unfortunately. So today, uh, we are just here mainly to talk about the brand, not not to sell watches. To be honest. Yeah, so we, we just want people to understand uh, how we came about with the design of Final One and uh, how the brand started yeah, at the same time. So uh, we will be talking about the Cove a little bit later. So just back to the Final One. So uh, when we have the showcase and uh, everything, so we we were pretty sure at that point of time that we were priced at the, the correct price range because uh, of the, the parts and the quality of the movement that we had chosen and used them. So if you uh, are following uh, Feynman for the past two years, you realize that we have been using top rate movements all the while. So we do not uh, want to uh, kind of uh, save a little bit on the movement because there's a there's a few different ways of movement that you get from ETA, right? So uh, we what generally is, is, try to get top rate movement other than chronometer, which they don't sell. So uh, if we is if it is available, we always try to get the top rate movement so that uh, we we give the value back to the consumer because we are not pricing it cheap at the same time. And also, uh, if you notice for Fiber One, uh, we actually do not use any stock straps uh, for it. So all all our Fiber projects, right? We try to use as much uh, collaborations with Singaporeans as possible mm -hmm. because we want to make it kind of like a uh, local project from Singapore rather than uh, getting a lot of uh, stocks uh, passed from the con uh, from factories and consumers, right? So we actually engage uh, 
uh, experienced uh, strap maker in Singapore. She actually, uh, she's a lady. She actually runs uh, her own uh, strap making company called E Leather in mm -hmm. Singapore. So every single piece of Diamond One is actually hand stitched by her and assembled by her for the straps wise. So every piece will be slightly different as it's handmade. And at the same time, uh, we ensure that the quality is there because we are actually using uh, our own strap makers. So all the QC and everything is controlled in-house from our side. So that's, that's mainly what we have about Final One. So for Final One, uh, we are very happy that uh, as of uh, last week, uh, last two weeks, we have actually sold out every single color of the, the watches. Not, so, a, not uh, a bad uh, problem to have. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, we, we actually sold out the Founders Edition on the launch day itself. The, the, the other colors, we actually launched it like six months later mm -hmm. after the, the first batch was launched. So, so subsequently, we, do some, we did some collaborations. We, I actually have a piece that is uh, collaborated with... Uh, this is a piece unique, actually. This is, this is my own watch. Actually, oh yeah, I, I maybe it has to be in front of you. Yeah. Wait, oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> this, this is a collaboration with uh, Russian uh, Russian uh, engraver. So his name is uh, Stefan. He, he actually works out from Russia. So it's, it's, it's actually a piece unique uh, watch that we made uh, with him. And uh, he actually uh, did an engraving for me for my horoscope. Uh, uh, which is the year of the ball for just Chinese onto the uh, great case back. And we actually did a triple NML on it. So it's something that uh, we have never done before. It was a piece unique design for, for us, like, from Stefan, which is a very good gesture from him. So actually, we are still working with Stefan on some of the other designs. Can, can people up. order custom pieces, order piece uniques for themselves? Yeah, so this... This, uh, we call this the Hawk and Lanterns on Fireman 1. This is actually a bespoke piece uh, by uh, Fireman Timekeepers. So we actually handle uh, bespoke pieces also for Fireman Timekeepers. But for the time being, as uh, we are fully booked, so we are unable to take any more orders for bespoke. Uh, because uh, it takes about six months to make a single piece of bespoke uh, collection. So, yeah. So, so that, the that's... Uh, so the one that people can order now is the new Cove, is that right? Yes, correct. So this is your new so one, dive watch. Yeah. Yes, the one that you are holding on your hand is, is the Feynman Cove, uh, which is the same one that is, you see on my background. So the Feynman Cove was uh, conceived after speaking to many of the watch collectors who have bought the Feynman one. So they actually requested for a tiger watch and they requested for loom, they requested for a thinner case, uh, automatic movement, and uh, something with uh, 200 meter water resistant at least for swimming and diving. So we actually took all this feedback, went back, and then we decided that, okay, I think it's time for us to launch a diver watch uh, to, for the consumers that give us feedback. So uh, Feynman Co was, uh, as you can see, the design principle is very much similar to 501. We still brought over our signature, uh, the second hand, sub second hands, and the uh, off center, the out concept, together with the logo plate and the golden ratio concept. So everything is still very much Feynman. So the reason why uh, we did this is that uh, it, it boils down back to the original vision that we had is that uh, we wanted to create a watch that is really unique in the market segment that we are in. Well, and uh, at the same time, uh, we, we want people to be able to recognize our watches from far. Yeah. Well, so, so what, what is the price segment for the, or what is the price of this piece? Okay, currently for this is selling at about, uh, I, if I'm not wrong, because I'm thinking from Sing dollars to USD. Yeah. For Sing dollars is about 1588 Singapore dollars, which maybe converts to around 1150 USD. About 11, okay, so about, about 11, 11 US, 11 now. yeah, 1100. And this really interesting approach to Loom, tell us about the motif, because I think most people aren't used to yeah. seeing designs yeah. or, or sort of art done in Loom. So, so for, as a watch collector myself, I, I 
I love looms. Uh, basically, I think most of the watch collector who collect diver watches, they, they would like to see a kind of a very strong loom. So uh, when we came up with the Fiverr Cove design, the first concept and uh, the first criteria we have is that the loom must be good because uh, as a diver watch, my right, loom is very important for us. So uh, at the same time, we wanted to think of different ways that we can present the loom and uh, how we can make it uh, interesting and not just like a uh, normal diver watch where you have your uh, uh, markers that loom up with a uh, second hand and our minute hands, right? So that is where we started on the drawing board uh, and we speak to the, the design renderer and then we came up with the concept that since it's a diver watch, we should have some kind of a wave design inside the watch. So if you can see, right, the wave design actually uh, is not just on the dial, on the mid side, uh, middle section of the dial. It actually goes all the way down to the straps. So our custom strap, we actually designed the, the waves in the middle of the track, mm -hmm. if you notice. So that, that wave is actually to represent the, the, the fluid between the straps to the watch and then to the strap again. So we actually incorporated this wave design uh, into it because we feel that uh, the wave uh, kind of signifies the diver watch and the sea. So that's how that's also how we came up with the name Cove because Cove is uh, as what you know right is like the, the border of the, the sea and the beach. Right? Mm -hmm. So it is just uh, ties down everything together for us. It's a really cool looking piece and very distinctive. And I, yeah. I want to emphasize, so these are all hand wound pieces. Was that, why was that important to you? Um, okay, for the Cove is actually automatic. Oh, it's automatic, okay, sorry. So the Feynman one was, so was hand wound. So if you see for the Cove, right, we actually uh, did some minor changes. So from, uh, from the loom perspective, right, every piece will have a slightly different kind of loom. For example, the one that you're holding, the blue model actually uses a BGW loom. So BGW actually glows blue in the night, right? So for the Founders Edition, the green model, yeah. we uh, actually uses the C3 loom, which glows green at the night. And uh, for for the the black model, the one which I'm wearing right now, so the vintage black model, we're actually using the radium loom, which is a uh, slightly yellowish uh, in color when it glows. So every piece is actually different, even though it's the same watch, but it's actually a different kind of uh, design and concept. And uh, if you notice the back of the case, right, the roto is actually plated blue on yours, mm -hmm. the blue piece. Yep. So for, for the black piece, the roto will be plated in gold. And uh, for the green, you will be plated in green. So it also kinds of differentiates uh, the different models of the, the final code. And yeah. where it, through your site, is that where the easiest place to buy these would be? Uh, currently, we have uh, three retailers. Uh, we, we are having the fourth retailer soon. So we have three retailers in Singapore. Uh, and I, from what I understand, they ship worldwide. So uh, you can actually purchase this from any of our retailers. And we have one retailer in Hong Kong, which is uh, also a specialized uh, microbrand store. So these four retailers are actually on my website. You, you will be able to purchase all the watches uh, through them. Or if you feel that uh, you want to purchase directly from our web store, it's, it's still available now. But I think there is only about five pieces left per color on our web store. Okay. So uh, nice. this watch was actually launched early this year, right before uh, COVID hit us. We were very fortunate that we managed to, to hold an event in Singapore. As usual, we have our pre-launch event for every model. Mm -hmm. We actually managed to launch it in Singapore and we got kind of uh, quite a lot of pre-orders during the pre-launch event itself, even before we launched it on Kickstarter. Wow. So th that is the reason why uh, for the pre-launch yeah. and Kickstarter, we are actually almost sold out for the final I mean, post. Again, wonderful, yeah. wonderful problems to have. Well, that's yeah. great. I think we're just at our time now. But YK, yeah. it's so nice to meet you and hear more about Feynman. And your son will hopefully grow up to be a very proud, uh, proud watch lover to have his yeah. own brand. And yeah, yeah the Cove is, is super cool. So thank you so much. It was lovely to meet you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. All thanks right. For the time. Take care. All right. Thanks, everyone. We've got crew up next at 435. See you soon.
Welcome back, everyone. I am back with Ariel, with Dane Rumble, and Tom Westgate from Crew Automatic. Welcome, guys. You guys are joining us from Australia. Absolutely. Thank you for having us, boys, and congrats on uh, an amazing event that you guys have put together. Uh, super, thank super you. Super stoked to be a part of it. We literally couldn't have done it without you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. Yeah, no, thank you. And you, you guys are an Australian based company um, with making Swiss made watches. I know Tom is from, but not from Australia. You are from New Zealand. That's correct. Yeah, we, uh, we both originated from New Zealand. I've been here in Australia for about nine years now, and I managed to recruit this guy a couple of years ago, two, three years ago. Yeah, three years ago. Um, as, as Kiwis coming to Australia, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty beautiful here. And it's, it's quite hard to, to go home, to be honest. We, we love New Zealand, but um, Aussie is fantastic. So yeah, I, 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 I heard you guys talking about that right before we came on. So you guys are not a new watch brand. You guys have been around since 2009. So you are doing something positive. Uh, so tell us about how it is that you survived the, the, the most challenging initial times uh, to be here 11 years later? Yeah, um, look, in 2009, that was probably when those initial kind of concepts were starting to come to my mind. We actually launched our first timepiece in 2015. Um, but the process between, you know, as I'm sure you've, you know, a lot of kind of watch designers and manufacturers have expressed is that it's so challenging that initial first prototyping phase to get the design perfect, to work out how production works. Um, and I was, you know, a huge fan of watches prior to that. Um, own a jewelry brand, or own a jewelry brand as well. So. Crulet, correct? Is it Crulet? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. And so we've been sort of running for about fifteen years here, and it was always uh, a dream of mine, like many, to um, create my own watch. And uh, so it was just a really, really long sort of time frame um, for me to kind of hash out the design, hash out the case design, right. try and work out, get my head around materials. <laughs> um, I, quickly, I quickly learned out, I learned that, um, you know, the watch manufacturing industry is completely different to jewelry. It's just a polar opposite. So mm. it was essentially learning everything from scratch um, I, to get to that first release. I know you use really nice materials. I've gotten to know Tom quite well over the past several months. He is, he is just a really uh, easygoing guy, very chill guy. And I started to learn more <laughs> about your watches with the Diamondback series, and I know Ariel has a Diamondback in his hands. Ariel, what do you? This is the very first time you are seeing a coup. Is that correct? Yeah, I uh, have been familiar with the watches, but as is the case with the uh, the internet era, you don't see <laughs> things all the time unless right. it's sent to you. Um, and this is a watch, and you know what I'm guessing right now. Actually, it's sort of a fun thing to do with me. Is is, is I'll take a watch and I'll wonder what the designer was inspired by, right? So you said that you are, um, you are a watch person, you were before this. And I wanted mm. to ask you, um, what are some of the watches that you particularly admired that you sort of channeled in here? And there's nothing wrong with being inspired by others. What, what tends to happen is before you come up with really original designs, you try to amalgamate what you like from other things that you thought were done well. And so I'm seeing a few things here, but please uh, talk <laughs> a little bit about the inspirations behind this. 100%. I, I think it's fairly obvious to take a look at the Diamondback in particular and then see a lot of Gento-inspired design. I, uh, so the, the Ghost series, which was the first model we released, i huge fan of the Royal Oak, huge fan of the Nautilus, just about anything Gento I was absolutely crazy about. Right. Um, what I wasn't crazy about, as I'm sure you probably heard, was the price. I was like, man, there's, someone's got to be able to do something about this. This is absolutely bananas. Um, and so when I first started to put pen to paper, it was important for me to, you know, definitely allow those inspirations to come through. But it was also important for me to try and hash out, in particular, a case shape that was unique that hadn't been done before. And as, I mean, you guys would know, it's pretty damn hard in, <laughs> in an oversaturated industry, you know, to have a completely unique case design. Um, but that isn't too dissimilar from what people are used to absorbing if that kind of makes sense. Because um, we, we could either sort of sway that way or we could go really, really different. And uh, my initial gut feeling was, we go really different, it's gonna be a, a really, really uphill battle. We would have probably died within those <laughs> years prior to the initial launch. So um, so for that this particular design, um, look, I was, I was inspired heavily at that point about geometric shapes in nature. 
And it sounds, uh, and I know people have, you know, these crazy backstories about, you know, the, the wash came from the government rah, 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 or something along those lines. <laughs> But for me, I'm, I'm all about design. I'm all about seeing things and absorbing things. And, and you know, and at that particular moment, it was, you know, seeing geometric shapes in nature. And we actually came up with the concept of the dial after kind of looking at different patterns. And it was the diamondback rattlesnake was what it ended up being. Right. So the diamondback rattlesnake. And we, we tried to carry that same design style onto the bracelet. Uh, as well, so it's it, it, that was essentially kind of the initial inspiration for that piece. It is very reptilian. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> and I know Dane, you are wearing the ghost. What, is it the V three? Um, oh, oh, Tommy's actually got the V three on. Yeah. Okay. So this is our latest range, and, and this is the one that you've got there. Yeah. Which... This is uh, also the V three in the titanium and uh, and the ceramic bezel only. And I think Ariel has not seen. This is the first time I'm seeing it in person. Uh, Ariel, what do you think of it? What do you? What do you? I'll have to think? check it out. So, so let, while I, while I'm checking it out, I, I want to ask. Oh, about, I'm sorry, carbon fiber bezel. You're right. I'm sorry. Yeah. I want to ask some about some of your experience in the manufacturing side. Now, the interesting thing comes uh, when you when you actually get the first prototype, right, in the mail. You've yeah. drawn it out in CAD. You've had, you've had this imagination. It's going to look like this. It's going to feel like this. And then when you finally put it on your wrist, uh, and again, yeah. we're not talking about the final one. We're talking about the prototyping phase. It's a different experience. What, and so my question is this. Talk to the audience a little bit about some of the lessons that you've learned through prototyping watches of suppliers, meaning never expect blank to be as you expect. You always have to mm. change this. Getting this done right is really, really hard. Things that you'd never know in the sort of computer design phase of, of making a watch. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to compare the tangible finished product versus you know three-dimensional three design or even a two-dimensional design. Um, right at the very beginning, um, Ariel, we actually got pretty lucky because the first prototype turned up and it was far better than I had anticipated. <laughs> that doesn't happen so, very often. You know that, right? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen <laughs> a lot. And so I think um, from that point, we've certainly, you know, had prototypes come through where we've had to make adjustments and had to make changes. Um, I feel uh, through this, you know, through the sort of last six or seven years of designing for myself, I've actually become very aware of how, Three-dimensionally, how a product is going to look. The only things that I'm, I'm, I'm still not 100% on are actually the materials. So we tend to find that playing around with the materials is, is what we end up sort of chopping and changing, sort of the finishing. So whether it's a sandblast finish or a, a brush finish or we do polish on you know, certain aspects of the case. Um, so it's those kind of details that once the... The prototypes actually turn up. That's when we're like, okay, that doesn't. So I, I, have, right. I have a theory about this, and tell me if you think that I'm onto something or not. It has to do with the fact that how light plays with materials is crucial in how we as humans interpret them emotionally, right? And in a computer, no matter how sophisticated the software is right now, it never truly is able to replicate how something actually plays with light in the real world. And so you might 100%. think. That, that plays with light in one way, and when reality you're in the room, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. We can't, it cannot be that. That is not my vision. And then you're like, how Absolutely, do I form the email yeah. saying, change this? You can't just be, sucks, try again. You're like, um, a finer grit? Like, you know, it's difficult to explain what it is you want them to do. Um, did yeah. you guys have to learn yourself how to communicate what your wishes were? Uh, were, were, the, were the suppliers and the factories uh, generous in telling you how to work with them? Explain a little bit in the communication lessons you learned and how to tell them, uh, gentlemen, this is how we want our watch to be. Please make it that way. Yeah, so our, we're quite lucky because we've had success with the same manufacturer since day dot. We actually haven't moved around. We haven't cha had to change suppliers. Um, and we had built up a we built up a really great rapport from quite early on, where they were able to send us you know um, pieces that they'd already produced for other brands, and so we could actually see and feel how some of these textures you know looked and, and how the finishes actually worked prior to us making some of those decisions. Um, but again, it, it was we've, we've got a very open book, you know we're very open with these guys. We can yell at them and 
And if, if they screw up, we, you know, we blast them. If we screw up, they blast us, you know. It's, okay. it's a, so the secret it's a is use expletives liberally. <laughs> okay, so Rich, you asked me what I thought about this. So I'll hand this back over to you, but I'm going to, so just on the exact topic. So I'm holding here uh, the watch, which is on the screen. Um, and this is a titanium model or is it steel? Titanium and carbon fiber. Bevel. Forged carbon, right? Yeah, it's, it's forged carbon, yeah. So, so okay, so let me let me let me be the reviewer that I am because you're saying <laughs> we we put a lot of emphasis into the into the finishes. The first thing I want to say is in regard to the forged carbon, I've seen a lot of forged carbon now, and I think you did a really great job of emphasizing the, um, the sort of texture that people like on the top of the bezel. So kudos to you there. That's hard to do because there's a lot of watches now that have forged carbon case, yeah. etc. And um, I think you got that, uh, that AP look, so to say, right? Because that's what everyone's going for. <laughs> um, the finishing, it's a sandblasted finishing. Good edging. Yeah. I'd say it's among you know, the, the better. What's the price point on this watch? That's 3200 32 Okay. Because it, again, it, it definitely has a feel of a more expensive product. I'd say overall, so even on the movement where you got some of the, the polished angles there on, on the rotor, which is obviously a custom for you guys. Um, I'd say that, again, when it comes to the finishings and surfacing, um, everyone, even Philippe Defour, would say you have w more ways to go, even on his stuff. But um, you guys are off to um, a, a great you know, mid-time in the brand. You're not new. Um, so this is, this is, a, this, this is a very good, good maturity. You want to see this again, Rich? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think I, I want to also uh, expand what uh, Ariel was saying. I think the dial, we've seen a lot of skeletal, skeletonized dials as well. And that even on the cheaper ones, if we see them on AliExpress, right, it kind of takes away from the allure of the real quality skeletonized mm -hmm. dial, the one that we can get for 15 bucks. Don't touch skeletons on the internet, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, ever. You have stories about that, I think. <laughs> no. No? All right. No. But I'm seeing this, and I'm seeing this for the first time as Ariel is, and I think this was done, very tastefully done. Um, it's not another skeletonized dial. I just think this is just... You know, I'm sure Tom's going to like this, but I think this is absolutely stunning. And it's the same watch that's on the print behind you. No. No? Um, that was actually the, uh, oh. that's the Forged Carbon. So that was the, the previous, previous series. That's um, the Forged Carbon case. Yeah, yeah for oh, Forged Carbon case, okay. Ghost Series. And this is the yeah, new so the one. Correct, yeah. So this, this dial has been completely redesigned from our previous two generations. Um, but yeah, the, going back to the skeleton, I'm oh, sorry, I'll let Tom talk at some point. I'm a bit of a flat <laughs> mouth when I get into these sessions. Um, but look, when it comes to skeletons, I agree. Like it, they can look really, really tacky if they're not done correctly. Right, I, exactly. I feel like the, it was, it's really important for me or for us, for our brand to make it seem almost as subdued but as detailed as possible. So the whole thing's quite dark. It's quite black. From a distance, it looks like a black face watch. You know, that, that's, that's always been a big thing about my design because I, I never want it to be in your face and have lots of things going on. I want people to get the piece, then to look at it, then to look into it and go, holy crap, there's a lot happening here in this dial. And, you know, going back to what you were talking about before, um, having seen them in person, Ariel, versus um, photos and whatnot, it's the same when it comes to marketing. You know, we can take as many beautiful photos as we can of a product, but until you actually get it in your hand and on your wrist, it, our, our customers are always just like, Yeah, no, I, I seeing like, that now, I mean, I, I totally review that because I think that once people see, you know, it in, in my style of photography, they'll appreciate it in a way that you, you never can with marketing shots. And I think that's the funny mm. thing. I mean, I've seen people put incredible resources into their marketing shots, making them look gorgeous. I mean. Rolex sets a standard. I mean, th those are like the cyborgs of photography. Like whatever started as a real watch at one point is, is so yeah. cybernetically enhanced that it's no longer real. Um, and, and yeah, you can, you can basically get away with magic in, in photography. That's, you know, I, I try not to, to edit images in, in a way that would distort what they really look like. But, you know, you see it in person and that's really what it takes. And these days, uh, especially um, without having events and things like that, um, you know, the sort of editorial opinion is really important. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's fun, you know, especially if you're interested in watches from that area. I don't know, you know, exactly what it is about the culture there, but there's a high appreciation of watches in Australia and New Zealand. Um, one of the very first brands that I ever talked about in a blog to watch was Magret, which was, you know, another New Zealand-based brand yeah. here. You consider yep. yourselves more Australian, but in Australia you have some as well there. And it's so amazing yep. that all around the world, 
um, the sense of sort of enthusiast-driven brands is taking on these local characters, right? Because the American mm -hmm. ones and the Australian ones and the ones in various parts of Asia or in Europe, they all have sort of different personalities. Everyone comes to it because of the love of the same product. But the way that they like to flavor and spice their product is different. And so the variety that people uh, have in, in the choices they make in the sort of one to 3,000 or even under 1,000 or up to 5,000 level, and that was just, it's as incredible as it's ever been. And so the industry is weird right now, but there's no deficit of amazing choice. And mm -hmm. it's always great to see the ability for newer brands to get market share. Because again, I think it's a niche game now, right? I don't think it's like, we're gonna get into like 100,000 department stores across the world. It's nah. we're gonna do really well with this particular audience that likes our thing. And, and that audience is lucky if the men or women behind that brand also have the eye for detail. So coming from the jewelry world, of course you're gonna notice finishing and stuff like that. That's why I always support people who go from a jewelry context to a watch context, because they understand the, uh, the sheen and, the, and the, the sparkle and the luster that the product needs to have to mm. catch the eye of other people. Let's just hope that we can have social events again soon so that other people <laughs> can notice right. these things on our wrists, right? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You, this is 3200 for the Ghost. But, and this is also your flagship. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Um, that's our, uh, that watch says 3200. Um, and that's, you know, the price point's a little bit high because of that forged carbon uh, bezel. We've also got, um, you know, a few new models coming out next year. Uh, three new Ghost models, actually, which will sit around just a slightly lower price point because, uh, we're using stainless steel again, um, going back to some plain sort of stainless steel models and, and various other finishings. Right. But, um, and then going to the Diamondback series, that price point starts at 1550 USD. So that's for the rubber mm -hmm. strap model, which you might have shown on the screen. Um, and then 1850 for the bracelet model. Yeah. Essentially, the Ghost model was, was the flagship model. Um, and it, it's been super popular. Like, we... It sells out prior to us finishing manufacturing every time. We're just I in this know. Weird, I, I've seen that on your website. Sold, sold, sold out, sold out, sold out. The Diamondback, uh, that's the one that gets sold out? And this. They both, they, they, they both get sold out a lot. It, it's, yeah, the, the Ghost model in particular, because um, it, it's, we've been really focusing on manufacturing in low quantities. At, at the beginning, it was because you know, that's all I could afford, basically. <laughs> um, but, but then we kind of worked out that Obviously, like having limited numbered runs is, you know, a big, a big attraction for a lot of watch collectors. Um, and so we, we decided to sort of maintain that, that sort of model and, and we still just okay. only produce maybe 100 to 200 pieces at a time. So that's the, that's the standard volume. If there's a limited edition, whether or not you call it that, it's somewhere between one and 200 pieces per, per batch. Uh, per sort of colorway, that's, color. that, that's sort of what we're producing at the moment. Do you, yeah. do you, we've been slow, slowly increasing it, but uh, yeah. Now, so that's a, there's a big question about that because I'm looking at, at this version of the Diamondback and I don't see on here you know, a limited edition number, or serial number, things like that. Do you think it's important to have that visual indicator on the watch itself that it has you know, a, a limited manufacturer? Mm. You know, even though the story is out there. To? Maybe um, this that will that will have a serial number on the back, but the diamond back, sorry, as that's an edition model. So we sort of just continue to produce diamond back model, keep that the same. The ghost series models, which Rich has over there, the, like the mono, they're all in, individually numbered. You'll see that piece is uh, out of eighty on it. Um, so it's that serial number out okay. of eighty pieces. So it's an important it's an on important the, thing the for catchback. the customers. They still like to have the information. Of course, yeah. What's what's Absolutely. coming? What's coming mm -hmm. next? for the brand, it, not just in terms of products, but how are you going to continue to evolve the personality of the brand, telling people this is, this is the crew values, this is the crew lifestyle. These days, especially at the level that your brand is at, you need to have developed the product arm, but also the, the lifestyle arm. The brand stands for this and does this. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we, we uh, our plan is just to continue to develop. You know, I'm always, we've actually, a little bit of a spoiler alert, but we are in the process of prototyping another brand new model. So something different to the Ghost series, something different to the Diamondback series. And it's actually got a slightly different case shape. It's a different movement. It's a GMT piece. 
Uh, and we haven't told anybody this, so this, this is kind of cool that we, that we can talk Debut about. Debut, everyone. An exclusive, yeah. You got the exclusive. Um, <laughs> and it was, really, it was really important for, for me to have, or for, uh, have you know, at least kind of three to four solid base kind of designs. And, uh, and so this next design, I, I really wish we could show something, but we've, we're not quite there yet in terms of having something decent to look at. Understood. But it's, we think it's going to blow a lot of people away. It's, it's something I feel beyond the Ghost series. We, we, we're still rolling with the skeletonization, um, but the K-shape is, I've gone bananas. I've thought, okay, how do I just do something that's, you know, even more sort of further away from the expectation, but is also still cool in the, from a design point of view. Um, yeah, so we've got that will be hopefully launching well, towards the end of the year, uh, the next couple of months. We should have something something out there uh, for people to view at least. So um, right now you've got the Diamondback series, you've got the Ghost series, you have something else really exciting coming on the horizon. You are an established brand. You are not a new brand. So I think we have to take your word uh, for what it is, which means an exciting new model coming out. So I think we're looking for exciting things from Crew in 2021. I know your watches have just literally impressed, you know, Ariel enough where he could speak highly of it. It's impressed me. I've reviewed the Diamondback. I, I quite enjoyed it. Um, where if we want to learn more about Crew watches, what can where can we learn it? What is the name of your website? Uh, it's just crewautomatic.com. Uh, I can follow us on. Uh, Instagram, all the usual usual spots you can find us. Yeah. Through automatic. You can sign up to our, uh, on the website, you can sign up to our VIP club. But it's um, automatic it's spelled with a Q, not automatic, like it's, it's, it's M A T I Q. Correct. Right. Correct. And not automatic, like the French spelling as well. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a real mouthful and it's hard to spell. And, you know, there's definitely a little bit of regret. Google it and good it luck, everyone. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dane and Tom. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks guys. So Appreciate it. Cheers. Take care. Cheers. See ya. Next up, we're going to have Martin and Mitchell from Marathon Watches, and that's how we're going to wrap up, and they'll be on at 5.05 in just a few minutes.
Welcome back everyone with the final segment for Virtual Microlux. The third day, I can't believe we are actually wrapping up now, but we kind of saved a really good one for last. We are with Martin and Mitchell from Marathon Watches. How are you guys? Great, Great right, thank there? you. So you guys are, uh, for people who don't know, and this is the first time I'm actually experiencing any Marathon Watches, you are from Canada, right? Is it Toronto or Vancouver? Toronto. Toronto. Yeah, we're from Toronto. And you... Upper Canada. Okay, so you guys have made... I know, I know Ariel has been a really big fan of his, your watches. I know I've seen him wearing them. I know he talks about them uh, highly. This is the first time I'm seeing them. So one of the first things I want to ask you is because I have not seen either of these models. Just can you quickly get... Which, which ones are these? I... I'm actually not seeing well, so I'm going to click on the zoom. So the black one is the Navigator. That is a watch that, well, I'm only, I, know, I know the history. So the black one's oh, a navigator. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the one on your right hand, which you're holding right now, that's our general purpose field watch. My father designed that one, that latest design in 19, I think it was 1971 or 1973. So one of your original ones. And it was, yeah, it was based after the specs of the GGW-13 for a big uh, GSA contract in those days. And we stopped making them with steel cases, the field watch, for the reason being we we're able to save the U.S. government a lot of money by moving to fiberglass and also lowering the weight values. 
What is we, the size we, on we this? We just reissued this. Okay, what is the size on this? Because it, it is uh, not a large watch compared to like the chronograph that Ariel is going to show you in a little bit. But millimeters wise, this um, it feels like maybe 34, 36 millimeters? It's about 36 millimeters. Am I correct, Marty? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. The Rolex, the Rolex Datejust size. I like this. This is first time I'm seeing It's a very comfortable it. watch. It's and because really of the smooth, uh, do you see the, the beautiful side I view do. on it? I the am impressed. Yeah. So the mechanical wind-up watch, 17 jewels, using an ETA 2801. I, I remember, I, I, saw, I saw you, Mitchell, wearing this specific watch, and you were wearing it, I believe, with long sleeves. You were kind of... Um, you know, you're dressed well, but in a casual environment. And I knew this was originally a military watch. And at the time, this was the standard size for a military watch because a soldier right. needs something out of the way and watches weren't that big. And I remember thinking to myself how elegant the lines on the case were and wondering to myself if the soldiers that had these ever stared at it and be like, that's a really elegant piece of, <laughs> uh, uh, of military equipment there. Um, it, the design is held up so well. But then in the 90s, mm -hmm. you did something a little bit more iconic, which is this very tall rotating bezel on, uh, on the G-SAR. Tell us a story about that design. Oh, that one, um, we designed specifically originally for the Department of National Defense, uh, D&D Government of Canada, for the search and rescue team that were on the, the West Coast and East Coast. And um, the, reason why I, the reason why I designed it like that was our mold broke, our original mold broke, and I spoke to a few buddies of mine within the Department of Defense, and I asked them what was wrong with our, what, what, what didn't they like about what we had before? What could we do to improve the product? And they said it was very hard to turn the original turning bezel, so I made it very high. I increased the water value to 300 meters instead of 200 meters, and uh, I made sure that the notches were able to lock into a mesh scuba glove so you could turn it. And also, don't forget, when your hands are really wet, it's really hard to move a turning bezel. And uh, we accomplished that. So I'm very happy about that. And it's become, you know, such an iconic look for you. Every brand wishes that they had a watch that from a little bit of a distance you knew what it was. They, they go to great lengths to do that. Marathon, interestingly enough, without ever seemingly trying to do that, has a number of watches that were designed for military and tactical and utilitarian purposes that now have this distinctiveness. And um, to a degree, you are, you are unique in the tool watch space uh, for that. Sometimes we chat about this. Do you recognize the fashion potential of the brand? Actually, when I designed the dive watch, Everybody said to me, because thin watches were in in those days, and uh, everybody said, it looks like a potato. <laughs> a potato? <laughs> Are you sure? The case manufacturer said, Are you sure? And I said, Don't worry. They made me pay up in advance for the tooling costs. And <laughs> wow. <laughs> but you know what? If you believe in something, you have to go ahead with it. There's only one life. And the thing is, we're not making our watches, we never made our watches for the jewelry industry. We made it for people that use it. And the people that use our watches use it for a certain purpose. That G-Star is for search and rescue divers or people who really go for a big beating with their watches. I expect the people who buy our watches to wear them, not put them in a sock drawer and wear them only on a wedding or a special occasion. Now, Rich is... Rich isn't the only person in the world that is a little bit uh, surprised at the small size mm -hmm. of some of the GPM watches. Um, I think that, that you know, it's a natural reaction because when you think of military watch, you think big, you think burly. The, the G-SAR is 40 millimeters wide. And it wears great. I'd say it wears a little large for 40. It also comes in a smaller 36 size. But then you go up to 45 in your largest case. So, it is true that, that there are some models that are for people that like smaller watches, and there's plenty, plenty of them, but Marathon really has sizes across the board. Um, and I think well, that Well, humans are built in all different sizes, yes. Ariel. Well, I gotta it's say, really? it's, 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 <laughs> you don't have male or female watches. It's just, you know, it depends if you have, uh, you know, if you have a 200 millimeter wrist or you have a 250 millimeter wrist. 
You have to wear what's comfortable. We're in America. We barely know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the metric. <laughs> I think 250 millimeters is basically, I think it's around 10 inches. Okay. That's a, that would be a big wrist. Yes. Yeah. That would be a big, okay, so you, you have it. Um, I, I think what's really important to mention to people is that even though Marathon is over 80 years old now, you've really only been selling to the general public for about a decade. And so I think some of the context of where these designs came from is, is crucial because even though anyone can go to the Marathon website and buy these now, mm -hmm. for the longest time, you had to, to be someone special. You had to get a government-issued one or something like that. And so these designs... Uh, came from those eras. None of these were consumer designs, and so you wanted people who actually weren't really choosing your watch. The end, the end consumer, the end wearer. You know, the government was choosing it, but not the end wearer. Um, you know, was just really lucky. You know, it wasn't like you have a couple of uh, military issue watches to choose from. Do you want the pretty one? And then all of a sudden, when you started selling to the general public. Um, you know, it started becoming popular. Tell us a little bit about some of the emotions and the things you learned as you transitioned from being, you know, just sort of a military supplier to also selling watches to civilians. Well, I, 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 I think the reason to our success has been that we, we built tools that were being used in a battleground environment or, 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 or just in an environment uh, where the watch is being used. And, and my father always felt that not only could we win the contracts because we actually manufacture the watches and sell the watches directly to the government so there's no middleman and all the money we save on advertising because we're not selling to jewelry stores, don't have to put ads in magazines or billboards, we could put all that retained earnings back into development of new products and improve the quality of the products we build. And if you build quality, people will come. And we were very lucky about the internet. Um, it just so happens that we always worked on government contracts and that was what we did. We did 120,000 watches, exact same watch and tested every single one of them. And to be honest with you, many of the watches we produced in the 1970s and 80s are still going around. And what, what I believe uh, happened was that a lot of people who were issued these watches and their children um, came to us by finding us on the internet. They would type in Marathon Watch or ADNAC, which is another one of our trademarks, and they would find us through the internet. And it just so happens our business suddenly built naturally and quite obviously expanded because now we have customers uh, throughout the world who have found out about us and liked our products and didn't know how to get them. So they could now get them. Yeah. And thanks to Martin Cohn, who started with the company a few years ago, allowed, made sure that uh, there, there are places throughout the world that, whether it be bricks or mo and mortar or online, people can buy these watches. So it, it's a, it's a good thing. And you know what? What I like is we, our customers are really nice people. You know, <laughs> I sure they appreciate that. They are. They are. They are. They're they're amazing people. And you know, you know, I have. I've made friends with a lot of our customers and they come up with some ideas and, hey, Mitch, why don't you do this? Or, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll give me their criticism and I appreciate it. Speaking of uh, all around the world, um, Martin on your team has some announcements about new areas that people can buy the watches from on the internet because you uh, weren't shipping around the world to every single country. Uh, tell us a little bit about more of the expanded territories out there that you uh, can sell watches to. Sure, thanks a lot. Um, well, we, uh, of course, are available in the United States and Canada and Switzerland where we make so. the watches and Switzerland. And, um, but we've got some great new markets now, Singapore, the Czech Republic, Australia, Italy, uh, just to name a few, and the UK as well, of course. So if anyone goes to marathonwatch.com and you go to the buy now section uh, or where to buy, sorry, section of the site, you can actually 
uh, it lists all the uh, different countries and uh, who you can buy our watches from. Or you can buy them directly from our site as well, of course. Martin, thank you very much for that. Uh, Mitchell, yeah. back to you. And we're going to talk about Switzerland now. The company is Canadian, but you have a facility in Le Chaux de Fond where the watches are manufactured. You do a lot of the things yourselves. You were just telling me how excited you were about the progress of your new rubber straps that are being manufactured uh, in Switzerland. And you mentioned something very interesting earlier about how when you were doing government contracts, you had a competitive advantage because you were not a middle person, right? You were producing the products yourselves. And in a lot of contexts, the government would purchase from a middle agent because they knew how to broker it with the government. Someone else was making it. Is that the reason why you initially went over to Switzerland to, to set up um, a manufacturer location? And, and why has it been something that you've maintained after all these years? Okay. Um, actually, our watches were always made in Switzerland. Uh, my family goes back to 1904. It was Wien's watch. And, you know, uh, my uh, grandfather and his brothers worked with each other. My great grandfather made sure that there was a son in every major city. And uh, my great uncle Alex, my grandfather's oldest brother, in the 1904, uh, was in New York and he uh, imported from one of his younger brothers who lived in Switzerland, my uncle, Mo my grandfather's brother, Monia, and he would arrange uh, manufacturing of watches for the whole family. And um, they were exported to my grandfather in Canada eventually and with our trademarks and uh, to Alex and uh, a, a few other brothers in the United States. But what we did was for the military contracts, we had subcontractors and we had watchmakers that worked out of their homes and we made kits. So we got all the dials and hands and movements and we'd send them over to the different uh, home industries. But we also used uh, some assemblers such as Galley for around 10 years and uh, some other uh, family-owned companies in the region. And Le Chaux um, is the heart of the watchmaking. And to be honest with you, we have to be there. We have to be there with our equipment and our people because it has the best watchmaking school in, in, in Switzerland, basically. And um, there's a plethora of dial makers and hand makers and, you know, strap makers. And when you receive dials and you, re you realize, oh, the, f the dial feet weren't placed exactly right. You could run down the street and say, hey, the feet are wrong. Everything's right for this watch except the feet. Get the dial <laughs> redone. And uh, you remember, it's like a car if you're missing you're missing one element of the car, you can't ship the car. So basically a $4,000 watch becomes, if you don't have the crown, you can't ship it. So it's good to be in the, that all our subcontractors are all our little suppliers, all our little family owned businesses um, are there for us. And we work together and that's why we started making our new movements. And we, again, um, inherently are, are always looking to make things lighter and uh, more efficient um, and save save the taxpayers money and we're able to make it in fiberglass for a less price and save save over the years i'm sure millions of dollars to both the u.s and canadian governments for what we do but we are reissuing the steel case just like we reissued the metal case it's just with this year of COVID, we have to be very careful in our factory and here in Canada. And things are taking a bit longer and uh, all the drawings are approved and it will come out. Now, you have a brand which is special amongst many watch brands in so far that you are not just a luxury brand. In fact, even though you have great products, you would never consider yourself a luxury brand because that's not the point. But during that's these times, a lot of people prepare there's this tactical um, community out there and there's a preparationist community out there and everyone needs to know the time. 
Has that been a boom uh, to Marathon's business, uh, given all the sentiment that many consumers out there have? Actually, it has. It's, it's increased our sales and I think people who are buying generators and buying equipment and making sure during these crises that we could get through it. What we've learned is, you know, we've made a lot of clocks for uh, different navies and battleships and aircraft carriers. And we've taken that technology and made hospital clocks. If you come to Canada, you'll come to government offices or airports and see our clocks everywhere. And it's because of the trusted movements that we designed for, for military use. And it so happens during the COVID crisis, we were able to act fastly with, fast with our um, hospital clocks. And as hospitals were being built in New York and New Jersey for, for emergency purposes, we were able to send our, our, our clocks out to those tented parking lots and get those hospitals going. So that, that's one thing I'm very proud of that Mitchell, happened. Thank here. you so much. Uh, Rich is gonna wrap it up. Um, and the, sure. the website is marathonwatch.com. Uh, and Rich, any closing statements? Yeah, I just, before we let you go, what are the, the, price, points, the price points on a navigator and uh, the, this, the first, the, one of the original models? GPM and the, the GPM. GPM. Okay. Switch to Martin now. Nah. He knows the pricing much better than Mr. I do. Mr. Price, inform us, please. Mr. Price, what is it? Well, they, I mean, our watches range in price for all the, from $200 US uh, up to $4,000. So that's really the price range. So the, the chronograph, uh, which is there, is $4,000. Although with the bracelet, it's a couple of hundred dollars more. Um, and, uh, so that's really the range. Okay. Uh, the GSAR is $1,200 just to give you sort of the mid price range. And then the opening price point of our field watches, they're $200 and up. Thank okay. you very much, Martin. Martin so. and Mitchell from Marathon Watches. Thanks so much. And this was worth the wait for my first time experiencing, uh, marath Marathon Watches. Glad you liked it, Rich. I did. I do. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, guys. Gentlemen. Thank you. Take Thank care. You Have a good evening. And I love your shirts. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so thank you to everyone as we are. Whoo, we, we have just Who wrapped we? up an entire weekend uh, of, of virtual microlux. It, it flew by, didn't it? Um, well, we talked to a lot of brands. A lot of brands. Um, I mean, these things are fun. I think it's, it's sort of this camaraderie about being around the team, which is what I've always missed the most from missing out on the watch shows, right? Being able with a group of people where you have a same mission, you know, whether it's to meet a brand or write about watches, or photograph them. Here, the, the shared mission was to produce this event, um, something that, that hadn't been done before by us. Um, is brand new for a lot of the brands that were the guests. And I'm imagining, even though people have had plenty of online conferences over the last few months, I think this was a novel experience for a lot of the community. And I'm very proud of, of always being part of novel things where yeah. we try to advance this because um, keeping people aware of what's going on in the watch world might seem trivial in the context of a lot of big problems in the world, but at the end of the day, this is a very important social um, and leisure outlet for a lot of people. I mean, watches are their hobby, and you know, other watch collectors are their friends. And mm -hmm. if there aren't new watches, what are they going to talk about? You know, <laughs> <laughs> lot of conversation. Yeah, it's 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 important. It's a it's a great coping mechanism. And I remember early on in March, I did. Um, a, a YouTube live series. Actually, that was my first YouTube live series. This is also live. And I just started pulling watches out of my collection and talking about them. I remember those. I and remember. Yeah. I, spent, I spent 21 hours doing that. I, I remember that series, yeah. 21 and I was And I still had other watches to talk about. I was like, that's, that was incredible. It probably still wasn't enough. You could have gone on and on I, and I, on. I had to end it at some point. You know, I had to end it. It was like, this is every day. It became like this obligation. Um, I guess it's a good opportunity right now to remind people about the blog to watch store. Oh yeah, so, I, this has been bothering me a lot. It's been this bothering has been, you? No, okay. it's has been <laughs> driving me nuts uh, all day long. How, and, how nuts, Rich? Look, how nuts. I, I, I've got to address this finally. So look at it, we look like 
uh, we're trying to be twins, and I can guarantee you there is no bromance going on here. But this, it, it looks like we were trying to be twins. Um, I actually or like we're this. we're both showing off merchandise. Right. That's another and I, option. And I was just yes. going to say that I'm, I knew I was going to wear this shirt. I didn't know that Ariel was going to wear uh, a very similar shirt. But uh, the, this shirt is actually one of, the, one of the shirts that we're both wearing. Okay, get me loomed up. So from the Block we're just, Watch we're store. Just, this is, okay, we're going to have to get the camera back on Rich here. Um, but this shirt right now, which is for sale um, on the Block to Watch store, has a luminescent uh, ink, and we have, we have a lot of these now. So I'm wearing actually a prototype of one that isn't sold yet. It was embroidered. Again, it's too bright in here, but this, this particular shirt glows. We have a lot of the glowing ones. These have been so successful. We call this the iconic dial. Um, again, of course, inspired originally by the Rolex Submariner, but it's no longer a design. Uh, which is is owned by them. It's just, it's it's such a generic design, and trust me. Um, yeah. Now now of course it's our copyrighted design for a shirt. But um, okay, here we go. We've turned on some of the lights here. So trust me, the loom is real. So um, much effort went into actually making it dark in here. So there we go. Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's it's actually not that dark in here, and you can sort of see the glow. But it's fun. Everyone gets so excited about it. Um, yeah, no, it looks, everyone here is trying to turn off lights. I love it. I love it. Oh. <laughs> this is my first modeling gig. I think it's my first modeling gig. You, right, literally, just now. And everyone will decide if there's going to be a second modeling gig, right? <laughs> I hope I'll get a call from GQ. No, That's this GQ, if you're listening, Rich is expecting your phone call. That's right. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's great to have a reminder that you are a watch lover, um, again, I think it's really important to remind people that the Blog to Watch store is a gift store for watch lovers. It is not, not a watch, watch store. store. Will not be watches. a watch store. We are a watch magazine where we offer um, uh, uh, impartial from a sales perspective view. I'm not impartial. I'm an editorialist. I have an opinion. I'm partial to watches I like. That's the whole point, right? Yeah, and I wanted to talk about uh, this T-shirt here. So I, th I think I saw this. This is the first time I saw it the other day, but I can tell you that the quality... Uh, is truly there. This is not the kind that you would get in a three pack. So I am a, I am, I am a sneaker. I am a sneakerhead. I love t-shirts. I live in uh, jeans and tees. Okay. So this is the kind of shirt that I would find at, uh, at one of the better department stores that I would, I would actually buy. Because like I said, it really is not. It's 100% a hundred percent ring spun cotton. Organic. Um, that Orga organic does it need cotton? to be organic? I don't know. I, I thought you're that not was... going to eat it, are you? I, mean... I, I, you know, I've been hungry all the <laughs> weekend. I don't know. Look, we, we became t-shirt nerds just like uh, we are watch nerds. So we spent several years researching the t-shirt industry and shirt cuts and fabrics were really important to me. Um, having 100% cotton yeah. is the most comfortable for me. I said, if I'm going to be customer number one, we, we'll probably offer some blends, but I don't know if getting into the actual like, materials of the shirt that people want to hear about right now. But if you want to talk shirt nerdery stuff, I will, I will do that for you. I'm just glad. I enjoyed wearing these. People um, have enjoyed seeing these because we've sort of been teasing these shirts for a while. Rich, I hope you enjoy yours. You look very good in yours. I will say that I've been getting a lot of comments too about what is this shirt and I haven't been able to address it uh, until now. So this is, a, this, isn't a blog to, this is a blog to watch uh, shirt. And I do want to put a little perspective into the size. So I'm typically a size large in a t-shirt, right? This is a 2XL. Um, so I would recommend if you're a, a true large, you might want to size down because I think they run a little on the smaller that, that's side. That's true. So this, this, these particular shirts right now, we're going to sort of have different runs from different places. These are manufactured um, for us um, in Europe. So these are European sizes. And just the way it is, a European extra large would probably be an American large. So Rich is correct. It's, you're, you're, you're not overly large. It's correct. just... Different sizing, different sizing. Yeah, so this is this is a. a I mean, if you want, if you want, if you're a normal guy and you want to feel obese, just buy a shirt in like Milan, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the other things that um, you know Ariel does, other than writing and reviewing watches and being that authority figure, is you also are what you refer to as a creative director for watches. Um, well, okay. So a designer for me is someone who. Um, you know, knows how to draw by hand or skillfully operate CAD software where they can do something. So a lot of people uh, during virtual microlocks told you that they have a background in industrial design, right? That's actually pretty crucial to designing watches. And so I have designed some watches like the one you're wearing. This is the, the Undone Aqua Black and Yellow. 
Uh, that was the first one that was released. I got a few more coming out. I was wearing uh, the Radox uh, from Laco. Um, there was the a third one too, right? There, well, the, the Dietrich was designed by Matt Smith Johnson from our team. So that is a, a blog to watch exclusive. Um, but what I, I call myself a creative director because even though I come up with a creative vision, I always have to work with a technical designer to, to put it down. So I think creative director is the more appropriate term. But I think the point is for many years as a media person, I was like, my role is to criticize and put down, but not design, right? Uh, but more recently, I said, you know what? I, I, let's, let's try coming up with some of my own original stuff. And um, you know, really what any designer will tell you is you just got to keep doing it again and again and again and again. And so you have to continue to experiment but I've, I've, I've hit a stride at this point where I feel confident in things being cool. And so when I came up with this idea in my head, um, the shirt I'm pointing at, but the watch as well, you, know, you visualize it and you ask yourself, do I want it? And if the answer is yes, you, 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 just, you just do it. Um, so again, thank you so much for, for plugging the Blog to Watch store. And yes, I am doing more creative direction work in addition to being a media person. And, and thank you, Rich, for taking the time. I think the most important thing that Rich did for all of this is communicate the value of something like this to an awful lot of scared brands, uh, right? I think so. If thank you, you for that. If you are a watch company in 2020, I don't blame you for being absolutely terrified. But the small brands have been more agile and persisted way better than some of the bigger corporate owned ones. And of course, any corporate groomed entity has these like several year strategies, something like a pandemic will, will derail that like a train off the, off, the, you know, off the rails. Yeah, and I would say that's also uh, uh, an established relationship that, that uh, I do have with many of the smaller brands that they could put their trust in me, knowing that this is the first time we're hearing of this, but uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna put our trust in you, let it fly and make it work. And I think together with you and, and the team, really made this happen. And you know, I, I thank the team, the, the crew behind the, the cameras at the beginning of the show, and I want to thank them again because they really made my vision possible to, to, to be able to be here all weekend. I have to thank Ariel Adams and the Blog to Watch team. But the people behind the cameras, the crew that work tirelessly to make this happen and to make our jobs easy where we can just come in um, and, and talk to the brands. I have to thank... We don't let them sleep, actually. Yeah, it's no, against I, their contract. Correct. To. But the thanks have to go out to Ed Ree, uh, Drew Coab, Jeffrey Min Min Minekees, Scott Badinger, Neil Willinson, and Sean White. You guys all behind the scenes made it all very possible uh, for us to be in front of the camera it's like and enjoy the week. Page. It is like an acceptance speech, but <laughs> the, the <laughs> amount of work that went into this, because this was no... Zoom presentation was enormous. If you guys could take a look at the set around us, I think that would be enough to impress anybody from Spielberg to Oprah. This is an impressive set. They did a great job. I have to thank the, the crew again um, and the producers doing this. One thing I do want to address is I think the producers did a great job at communicating the information to us with the, with the good questions and the comments from the engagement because we had hundreds, literally hundreds of terrific engagement. It was a little challenging because this wasn't a set up for a Q&A where we are relying or depending on uh, certain questions to move the show forward. It was very challenging to have to interrupt the brand, so it was a little bit uh, off-putting to interrupt the brand for a moment to get in some questions, but I think we finally were able to do that today because there were so many questions and we really appreciate all of your engagements. Um, everybody did a really great job. What was your biggest takeaway, though, from, from the three days of VML? Well, I, I first want to thank the community for following along and, and making all this happen. Um, to say it couldn't happen without the community is an understatement. Yeah. We do this for you. We do this because there is the hunger for watches out there. And I think that's the first thing that, that I learned, or at least it was confirmed to me, that no matter what, the interest in new watches just remains high. Yes. As implausible as that seems to be sometimes, um, when life is challenging, it's hard to focus on the fun in the world, but um, watches and the appeal of them and, and all their various forms and all their price points and all their styles continue to appeal to an enormous amount of people out there. And so I agree. I, I am reminded of the amount of friends I have out there. And that's a wonderful, yeah. wonderful feeling. Um, I also think it's important to thank the, the, yeah. the presenting sponsors. I, we have so to thank eBay, eBay, Indie Jewelers, and Indie Breitling. And Breitling. Um, 
you know, putting on something like this is um, a challenging event, and there's a lot of costs associated with it. There, you know, at, you know, Rich was thanking the crew. Yeah, there isn't just like an iPhone, you know, yeah. like on a like on one of those selfie sticks, and that's that's <laughs> what we're doing here. We keep plugging it in. I mean, th this is this is a real production, and. Um, it wasn't like a bunch of brands went to us and be like, hey, we have a great, use, a great amount of budget for you to do these things. Um, we knew that there was a demand for this. I mean, months ago at this point, when we learned that there wasn't going to be any watch shows, we had to start making a plan of how we would chart 2020. When I say we, I'm talking about the, the watch media community. Everyone's done it differently, but the watch industry you know, has, is not exactly our leader. They don't just say like, hey guys, show up, do this. Maybe for some media they have, but we've truly had to create these opportunities. And the brands that understand it and appreciate it and the consumers that follow it, um, is, it's so wonderful to see um, how, how needed and how useful this stuff is. And I'm really honored by all the people who, um, who send us positive messages and thank us for what we're doing. We appreciate it. If we mm -hmm. didn't get that feedback, we probably wouldn't be doing it. So thank you so much again. Um, coverage of, of all of the brands here um, at Virtual Microlocks, you can see it on a blog to watch or their respective uh, websites. I hope that you've got to know some of the interesting characters behind these brands. I, I find it endlessly enjoyable not only you know, learning about new watches, but who's that guy? Who's that woman <laughs> behind that brand? What's yeah. their deal? Where did they come from? And during these interviews, I really try to get a lot of that. I imagine if you were at a watch show and, and they were standing behind a booth and you were looking at their watches, what should they be telling you as a consumer and what should you be asking them you know, as a consumer so that you get some type of, you know, not just entertainment, but fulfillment out of interaction. And I think we successfully did that here. I, I did too. And I think a really good example for me personally was with Marathon, whom we just concluded with. It's the first time I've gotten a chance to know uh, Mitchell and Martin personally and seen their watches personally. So I was just like anyone else. Uh, and I thought that was a real benefit. I wanted that conversation to continue. I wanted everything to continue uh, longer. So 2020, 2021, uh, we hope to get back to in-person events. We just have no idea how that's going to be. Um, maybe it's another uh, virtual show like this, um, but in the meantime, definitely we will keep you informed. You can always follow uh, me, what's on the wrist, underscore official on Instagram or our lamicrolux.com website, and we'll always provide you updates. Um, you can also learn from Ariel Adams and a blog to watch for information as well. So because 2021 is so not sure what's going on, just follow us. We'll continue to keep you updated. And I think for myself and Ariel, we're going to sign off for Virtual Microlux on, on a great weekend. Thank you, everybody, our sponsors, the viewers, for making this just an unbelievable event. You've been fantastic. Thank you so much from all of us. Yep. Have a good night. Thanks for making this possible. Thanks for making our jobs easier and fun. Have a good night.